What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the UP. <clears throat> Today we have a special guest. Really, Brett, I haven't told you yet, but the reason I wanted to have you on because you're a huge Biden fan. <laughs> you uh, you you hate guns because they're so dangerous. For sure. Um, you're a very innocent human being that would never hurt a fly. <laughs> Um, you love when the government takes your money as well. So, you know, you know I just wanted it. to... <laughs> just, <laughs> the most responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be a responsible human being and pay, mm -hmm. pay, pay my mm -hmm. share. Mm -hmm. No, but Brett is... Uh, we met through, I think, just fighting right mm -hmm. off the bat, right? Like, mm -hmm. I was just reaching out. Yeah. I don't know if it was through someone or I just reached out to you. I can't yeah. remember. You got a recommendation and... Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. Someone had told me, hey, this is where you want to go when you want to get your striking, because mm -hmm. I started the jujitsu part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I was exploring the idea of being a fighter. And one thing that really sticks in my head when uh, when I talk about this segment on my life, because I had a choice. I can either dive dive in and be a fighter, or I can keep like growing my businesses and things like that. And you're like, it's really hard to be a fighter when you have your shit together. <laughs> okay. And Especially in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. You said that to me and, and looking back, like it, it makes a lot of sense. Like why I, you, you know, you're either choosing to pull your shit apart, you know, kind of like break yourself down and just mm -hmm. dive into fighting or build your career. And, and I mean, the, the first advice I give any fight, you know, p potential fighter is this is probably not a good idea. And people are like, oh, well, you're a fight trainer. Well, it's like, listen, like, I've kind of got a unique situation with my life being that uh, my gym and, and fighters are not how – it's not my livelihood. So I, that allows me, I think, an advantage. And I can be much more brutally honest with potential fighters and students um, than most people that are paying their mortgage with the gym can be. Um, I think that gives me a little bit more freedom. It allows me to hold extremely high standards – um, which don't ever break because I'm not dependent on your, you know, these, these kids' money to s take care of my wife and four kids. Right. So, uh, which in I, most cases, these guys are like these trainers. For sure. These for sure. You know, I've often thought, like, man, I don't know how you would ever want to do this as a job. Um, I'm kind of a more of a purist when I look at this. I have a extensive traditional martial arts background since I was about third grade when I started and you know MMA came later in my life I was you know as soon as I got out of the service it was I was probably like 25 years old 24 25 and that's when I started so I kind of had a whole traditional background up until my MMA uh, career started so I've always looked at it a little bit differently than I never really looked at it as a sport I've never put that you know connotation in my head where it's always been I've always tried to maintain the martial aspect of it, um, and especially the philosophical aspect of that. I that was one thing yeah. that you really harped on me. When we first started training, doing our one-on-ones, you were sending me, like, YouTube videos of, like, world history and um, a lot of uh, – oh, man, I can't remember exactly. It was uh, not Russian times. Um, Roman times. Roman times. Roman sure. times. Tons of Roman videos. They were like an hour long. I was like, damn, man, yeah. I got work, bro. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and, you know, I because I always in my own. So I'm a, I'm a big history guy. Um, anybody that knows me knows that. I mean, I, I I'm more into just than casually. You know, I collect and I restore Roman coins. My wife is an archaeologist. I mean, it's you know, I've been on archaeological. Where did that where did that come from? Like, why do you why are you so into history? You know, I think it's just. Part of that old, being an old soul kind of connects me back. It's part of my heritage. My family's from those regions where the empire was strong. Um, and I think I always kind of tuned in as a soldier itself. I could relate to, and there's very few things that can connect you to the past the way, you know, war, you know, trying to be a warrior is in a modern day, uh, you know, and as a soldier, a prior soldier, and as a martial artist, I like to think that those kind of pressures that you can be under and those kind of occupations can connect you back to someone thousands of years ago. The same way in a firefight when I was in Iraq, I mean, that fear, that, that um, adrenaline, that reliving or, you know, kind of relying on training, coming into play, turning the mind off and going into autopilot. These are the same things a guy would have done in a shield wall two millennia ago, you know. So my connection with it in the fighting was always to try to get what, what does it take to get a man to stand in a line, sword and shield, and for hours at a time? Throw their life in, in the in Right. The you know, what, what can motivate? You know, it's always been a, 
you know, how do people, how do single people motivate thousands to do things, you know? And, you know, I always, the, the Roman era, especially the early rep, or the late Republic and, you know, the Julius Caesar times are where I really focused on because Caesar himself was someone that led from the front at a time where Roman generals were not very expected to do it. They were, had fallen back into the realm of, you know, charge instead of follow me. And in, his way of going about it was able to galvanize tens of thousands of soldiers to then rebel on his side, you know, against, you know, at a time where rebelling against the government was considered a sacrilege, not just a, not just breaking the law. There was no separation of church right. and state at this time. These were every single government um, thing that was done was in itself a religious ceremony. Mm -hmm. So to convince men at a time that were highly superstitious to then throw that all away strictly on pure loyalty to the one person was something had not really been seen. Had prior, there had been prior instances, but never at the scale of what Caesar would take it to. So I've always kind of looked at, like, how, is, how does a man able to convince somebody to go forward with that? And, you know, and the way I've turned it into the training aspect is I have got to, especially as still being a younger coach at 41, I've got to lead from the front, therefore I have to train with them. I can't be one of these guys with beer, a gut, mm. telling them, do that, do that, mm. do that, you know, why did you do it? You know, they're not even, you know, there's anybody that will, whether it's an athlete, you know, if that coach never really played at a high level, some, sometimes harder to look at the advice he's giving you fully, even though he might be, know what he's talking about. If you have that extra ability in you to go forward with them, to bleed with them, their loyalty and their ability to look at or listen to what you're saying is going to heighten. A hundred percent. I remember there were a couple moments in my life that I can look back on and I can say, this was like, this is like a big reason why I wanted to train. Mm -hmm. And there was one, I was a senior in high school training. Like, wasn't really like a big thing. Like everyone trained with their high school. Now it's very different now. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of guys will seek outside training because they know that inside the high school, it's just, that's not where it's at. Mm -hmm. And there was this big, he was probably a former lineman, and he was making us all. We probably did like 100 V-ups, and V-ups are not easy. Mm -hmm. And I remember this guy getting pissed. He's like, you, drop 20 V-ups. And I thought in my head, I'm like, there's not a chance you can do 20 V-ups. Mm -hmm. There's not a fucking chance. I couldn't chance. do five. Yeah, you probably can't do five V-ups. And I remember thinking like, whenever I do this training thing, whenever I am a coach, there's no way my kids will doubt that I can't do what I'm telling them to do. Mm-hmm. And that's always been a really big thing for me for all my coaches. And I understand, like, you get older and you lose your abilities, you lose your hand-eye coordination. Like, we, Coach Mack was one of my favorite co coaches of all time. He was, like, pushing 80, and he was out in the field with us. And, like, obviously I'm not going to demand that mm -hmm. he does the things that we do. But, like, the 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds and the 50-year-olds, if I don't think you could run a gasser, I lose a little bit of respect. Sure. Just a little. Sure. So that's, that, that's always been, like, really big for me, and that's a great point. I mean, it's even it was down to the to the small level in you know as far as the legion goes. The everyone's heard of the the centurion. Well, the centurion's position was only there be, not because well at some points nepotism, but when everything was going hard, that guy was there because he was the most hardened, he was the most disciplined, and he was the most skilled warrior that was on that line. That was the guy that galvanized people to stay. The centurion was never behind his soldiers. He was always in the front line. Can you explain what a centurion is? So the centurion would have been like um, the commander, you know, besides the name century sounding like 100, they commanded 80 men. So they were the backbone of what the, the you know, the army was. Um, it wasn't general, you know, generals could give orders. Centurions are the ones that made it happen. On comparison to your sergeant majors slash company commander level within the modern day military. Um, so these guys were the ones that maintained discipline, maintained order, but also were expected in their duty to be the one on the front line. Never, he never got to take a break. Right. So as those guys were rotating, he was meant to stand there wearing a very opulent headdress so people could spot him. Cause even when there was fear, a soldier could look to his right and see the centurion and say, well, he's standing on his ground. I cannot run. You know, there was a collective shame among soldiers that, I mean, cowardice was worse than death. I mean, there was, there was times where um, units had ran from battle and generals had brought out, you know, an, an, basically an ancient punishment called decimation. 
you know, we've heard this term before to decimate something. We don't really, some people don't understand the, the origin of it. And it's from a, a Roman military punishment where every man, every 10th man in this unit that had shown cowardice, regardless if you had ran or not, would draw lots and every 10th man would be put to death by his comrades. So you and I could have been stood, you know, stood side by side, didn't run. The guys behind us did. If you're the one that gets the lot, I'm handed a club and all nine of us got to beat you to death. So, I mean, the, it, it drew to the, these more men were more afraid of their commanders and, and, the, and the, the punishment that would come from cowardice than it was to actually die with honor. You know, these things. And the centurion was the one that embodied all of it. So if you're not willing to stand first, how do you expect guys not to stand with you? You know, it's... it's well, this... Uh, it seems like the the thing that is really gravitating you is like the psychological aspect sure. more than anything. And this is, that's the mindset you need. I was just talking about with someone the other day, you need to be a little fucking psycho if you want to fight. Like you need to be a little crazy. You're Something's touched in the be... head if this is a, a career, especially a career choice. Yes. <laughs> and I always say that we're all a little touched in that. I said, you know, you got to be crazy to want to be a fighter. You got to be double crazy to want to make it a career. train them and, and then be the guy that trains them and has the... You know, being a co to be a good coach is to be a good general. I mean, because the general's job is to su support logistically. You know, there's an old saying that um, Alexander used to say, Alexander the Great, that he said, amateurs speak of tactics while professionals speak of logistics. Your end goal can be whatever, but how logistically are you going to make that happen? Yes, I want to take an army across and I want to conquer this region, but... How are you going to supply that army with food, fodder, water, the animals that you're going to have to take with it? Do you understand the, where, what seasons are growing that you could possibly forage for food? Or are you going to have to supply everything? I mean, these things, planning campaigns, and it's the way I look at fight camps. There's a campaigning season. We've got from here to here to make these th you know, critical freaking points made before we get to that goal. How logistically are we going to make that happen? That goes down to their food, their 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 trainings during the week, how many trainings, water consumption. I mean, all of it. You don't plays think about that it. stuff too when you right. when you read about history. You don't think about the logistics behind it, but there had to be a ton. How could you? It, I mean, feeding you all the men. Couldn't keep. I mean, you got to think, especially in deep antiquity, where armies were gigantic. I mean, if you want to look, it's at not armies, like there was a freaking freight truck, nothing carrying their food for you. Half the time, you had to make the road. You know what I'm saying? And then right. you had to relieve, you had to set up bases along that route to secure the route. So you couldn't just move past and then the, the enemy comes back in and starts taking everything. You had to leave soldiers in garrisons to protect these routes. So you're depleting your army through strengthening, just through strengthening your supply route. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, why you had to have, then you have to have the allies you have to incorporate into these you know, client kings and local chieftains and all these people that guide you and all these, I mean, so it's almost like dealing with the promoters. You have to have relationships outside the army that benefit the army, you know, and you mm -hmm. have to go about it and be fair. You can't go and run around and steal everything and have your soldiers abuse it because they'll never want to work with you again. You know, I look at that with his promoters. Being good with promoters is, to me, literally what I've realized is simply just fucking answering emails on time. In a timely manner, and picking up a phone when the, someone calls you, well, we're and so... if something's not happening, update them. I mean, it's it right. literally <laughs> basic communication <laughs> skills. They're out the window. It's they're gone. crazy. They're gone. It's the difference between like a good relationship and no relationship for me because I cannot. The everyone's glued to their phone. Everybody, right. me included. I will admit it. So the fact that you can't send me a text back or you can't right. email me or you can't let you me know, know what's going it. on, especially if we're in business together somehow, sure. and you don't tell me what's going on, it's like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. There's a monetary exchange here, and you are not sharing all of this information with me, and then I find out from someone else, it's like, right. what kind of man are you? You know, and I was listening. I was in um, I was in, in September, this last September, I was in uh, – Ireland for a Bellator fight, you know, and I was listening to, you know, I'm down at the, you know, the, the lobby, the bar, and I'm listening to, and all these execs here, and there's agents there, and I'm listening to them all talk to each other, you know, and I'm hearing the agents, you know, the, the fly on the wall. Yeah, the managers justifying their, 
you know, the reason they need to exist and, and then the promoters talking about what they need to have for managers to get things done. And and then, I, you know, the one guy just looks at me because he was listening to and he was the, the matchmaker for Bellator, the European side. And he just goes, you know what it really is? He's like, it's literally the personal relationship between the coach and the promoter. He's like, if you're easy to work with and you bring a quality They product, want you back. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> you know, if it's if all I have to do is have four emails between you, and we can have everything settled. Mm-hmm. Who and then you're not you're not dealing with a prima donna. You're not dealing with, if there's an update. Hey man, you ask, you asked us. I don't know the answer. Let me get back to you and give a timetable. Is it <laughs> like that with the pros too? If, absolutely. I I found like it's you know I've had too many promoters say they love you know. Well, we said Brett, you know I really appreciate working with you. You you make it so easy, and I'm just thinking like. All we did was email a few times. Right, dude. Like, and it, it's like, well, my guys show up, they make weight. They're always a high quality, you know, they're always going to be a high quality martial artist in every aspect. They're well, going to bring it. That was one thing I remember you harped on me, dude. You were like, I, because I was like, how do I get in a fight? How do I get in a fight? And I wanted to, I'm, I'm older, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. how do we make this happen faster? And you're mm-hmm. like, no, I'll tell you when you're ready. Right. I mean, and, and, it's, and that's, that is not an ego thing. Well, I'll tell you when I'm, when you're ready. No, this is a, no, and my I didn't first take it that way. Either, right? yeah. My first and foremost thing is your health and well-being. Okay, especially if you if you want to have a career. the The reason why I'm so stringent with my my, my standards is because that is what's going to save you. I mm-hmm. mean, hand positioning even now is atrocious, and the vast majority of the professional level, high level guys still carry their hands off their chin still dip and weave and drop their guards. I mean, it's it's crazy and because you're, you're dealing with a four-ounce glove. This is not boxing where the glove can cover the entire side of your head, basically. You have basically what your fist covers, and that has to cover the most vulnerable point, which is that point on the jaw, the button, everyone calls it. Well, the it. gloves are just to protect your knuckles. <laughs> really? I mean, it does nothing. I mean, it's it's very minimal what you get from that. So, And then with the variety of strikes you have to deal with, on top of positioning yourself that would probably take down. I mean, you've got to carry body weight and move a certain way. I always say, like, fighting's gambling. So it's like you've got to st- stack things that you control, odds in your favor. I mean, you don't want to be the gambler. You want to be the house. You know, my, my family was in the casino business, and my uncle, I remember being a kid, and him telling me, yeah, you see those, see those big casinos? Yeah, they're not built because people win. Yeah, You know, and it's just like, well, why does the house win? Because the odds are in the house's favor. So if us going into it, that we know our cardio is stacked, we know our takedown defense is solid, we carry our hands on the chin and we move in certain directions, and there's things that we have set up and drilled that put the odds in our favor, that's how you have a, a career that can go, excuse me, have a, go, a career that can go and, and not be a mush mouth guy with Parkinson's after right. it. You know, and CTE out the ass. I mean, especially in training. That's where the majority of guys in their careers take the most damage, is in training. We've seen a, th- a billion fights that have ended in 30 seconds and no one's been hit. The trauma that guy induced base, was induced to was through his training regimens. Poor sparring, too hard of sparring, too much sparring. sparring. Uh, you well, know, so many injuries happen during camps. Of course. So many. You know, I, that's why I say guys that want to fight for me, it's like you're, you're taking on not a job but a lifestyle that encompasses the entire year after year and year after year. As long as you're going to do this at a high level, it's like otherwise get out of it, dude. I don't understand why you would risk, especially now. I mean, the level of athlete that's come into the game is crazy. That's what where the jumps have come from, in my opinion, like – it hasn't come so, so much from jiu-jitsu, or jiu-jitsu developing new techniques and boxing. It's all the same techniques. But now it's better athletes. But it's now it's guys, like like we were talking before, give me a D1 athlete and watch how long it takes me to turn him into something. Because when strikes are involved, the grappling becomes very basic. Mm-hmm. The wrestling becomes very basic. You don't have to teach these guys an extraordinary amount of techniques to get them solid. That's why you never you see know? anything crazy with jujitsu. You see arm bars, you see guillotines, you, you see rear punched. naked chokes. Yeah. That's about it's it. So basically your five first submissions you learn. Right. It's and then triangle. The, you see a the triangle. Triangle, arm yeah. bar, rear nakeds, guillotines, 
Yeah, and every even, now and then you'll see something crazy. And even arm bars are but... becoming less and less. It's really the height. You know, my philosophy always is to not never give up a top position for a submission so with something like that, like an arm bar, where you don't have someone's neck. You're better off to just stay on top and keep pounding him and force him into a, a more high percentage finish, like a rear naked, rear naked or something choke. like that. Where if, even if he doesn't, the choke doesn't get in, releasing it doesn't negate the fact that we're in a dominant position and we can just start pounding him more. You know, that's the key, in my opinion, is using your strikes during your to facilitate your grappling, mm -hmm. to not try to just bludgeon a guy to death, especially a guy that knows what he's doing, who can c catch the shots and roll the shots and, and not absorb them. Or the guy that just tried I mean, there's been a million fights where guys have gone out, tried to fill it and finish him on a ground and pound surge and gassed. The guys reversed them, taken their back, pounded them out or finished them because they blew their wad. Um, it's you're better off using small, fast, coordinated striking to open up his guard, to open up positioning to where I could advance to a more position to where when I get there, I can then rain down heavier shots. And as long as I'm coherent and, and understand where he is under me and understand where his exits are, I can force him into these worse and worse positions without bringing weight off him and out overthrowing punches if he's trying to buck on me and stuff like that. You know, I just stay on top. I float and I wear him out because when a guy's continuously under fire, everywhere he turns, he's hit. He turns, he's hit. It's sooner or later that you're overwhelming that primitive, you know, portion of the brain to save yourself. You're going to flip and give your back and get away from the strikes. Right. It's like Mike Tyson. Everyone's got a plan until you get hit in the face. Right. And when you're getting hit in the face over and over and over again, you start to just fall apart slowly. Right. And fighting is such a game of chess, man. It's such a game of chess. At the high level, definitely. Um, you've got to be. And this is where, you know, younger students, you know, building them up from the white belt to the blue belt level to the purple belt. There's there's mental transitions you have to have, not just technical transitions. You've got to get, you know, in, in the beginning, it's single it's single moves as a, as a white belt. You're learning single things, single sweeps. You know, you're trying not to get finished. You know, that's the, I always tell the white belts, your, your main goal is to not be finished. Don't think you're going to submit people. Don't think you're going to sweep. Survive. If you survive with that blue belt, you won. He didn't. Mm -hmm. You understand? That's how you mentally build yourself up to understand. And because the most people get frustrated in the beginning, especially if they're athletes. Ego. You have to have an 100%. ego death. You have to put it away. Totally. Don't, I don't want to see people, you know, I've seen guys, you know, they hit the ground, um, yeah, you punch yelled, the mat. You yelled at me one time. Yeah. Well, but the, but it's it's just like, think about it. Don't be mad at him. Thank him. He let it go. Mm -hmm. Your That was your buddy that let it go. Mm -hmm. This is a match or this is a guy on the street that knows shit, and he's taking that, that ligament with him, you know. Mm -hmm. So slow it down. Why did that happen? Tell yourself. And then fix it. Sometimes put yourself, especially bigger guys, put yourself in bad positions constantly. It, it's easy to stay on top of somebody when you're six foot four and 240 pounds that can move. It's a different thing when you're on your back and now a guy's got a little pressure on you and he's forcing you into the bad situation. If you don't practice to be under duress, you know, like I said, especially the bigger guys that just have to do you. Know, like you're going against guys half your size most of the time. Yeah, it took me a while to. I, you know, I play the smash game. I play like the, right. you know, the Nikki Ra game of jujitsu where I'm just going to, I'm going to overpower you. I'm going to make sure I get on top and I'm going to work my way until I get something. And probably like a year ago, I started playing the opposite and I realized my defense fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. It's horrible because I never worked on it. Mm -hmm. And so, especially guys that are coming into fighting, you know, I always tell them what you're doing now to that guy is not going to be what happens to a guy your size because you're right. not competing and not learning to fight guys smaller than you, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, that's the way I, you know, what I tell my students, I go, I am not training you and teaching you to fight Joe Schmo. Okay. I'm fighting you and holding you a level that if you meet somebody that knows what they're doing, that has taken the wrong path in life, that's who I'm training you to fight against. Mm -hmm. Not some guy that's going to just somebody that's the regular run of the mill guy. What's the point of that? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're focused, you know, Put yourself in the mentality to where if you were standing in that shield wall and you hit this, you know, you kill the first guy and he drops, well, the fight is not over. The battle is not over. There is another one coming right after him with the same intent, you know. That's why it goes back to that mental training of how do you convince people to stand in a line and fight 
people that if you know every death is going to be terrible. You know, there's it's not going to be like in my in my war where a mortar just falls in and hits you in the head. You know, or you know, or an IED goes off and you think just play. It's going to be a, a gruesome death, hand to hand guy in your face sticking a sharpened piece of metal into you. You know, mm-hmm. and if I somehow manage to fend him off, there's like three thousand of them after. The I mean, thought of that, man. This is the mentality. We live in this yeah. cushy little world now. Like we're in, we're in my basement. We got heating and air conditioning. Water. It's like <laughs> water. Clean yeah, clean water. water at your disposal. Mm-hmm. And you know, just thinking about other countries. Some other countries don't have clean water. Like we have this cushy little lifestyle, and that's uh, I think that's the reason we've created the society we have where we got people wanting to switch genders we got all this like completely unnecessary conflicts we're and all, think about it we're only 80 years removed really from when people had none of that i mean if our my grandparents were 80 years so world war ii the greatest generation so you know what my grandparents i don't know how your, old your grandparents are but my grandparents were world war ii and you know the great depression and I listened to how my grandma talked about we had lit they had literally nothing. They lived in Chicago. We were so poor, you know, we kept this is why when we moved this woman out, we found cash in all of her socks. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Because it was like they're from that generation. My grand my grandparents had built, you know, a small, you know, enough money to retire comfortably. And my grandma still acted like she had just went to the food bank. You know, it was just ingrained in them because literally Because it's just taken like that. Post World War II, there has been an basically almost uninterrupted level of prosperity, generation after generation, in this in this country primarily. I go, you know, where my wife was from, Bosnia. Uh, I go, you know, I tell people, you don't think it can it can fall? I go, Bosnia with the former Yugoslavia. I mean, they hosted the Sarajevo hosted the Olympics in the in the early eighties. Six years after one guy died. That place was ripped apart into civil strike, you know, civil war, and ethnic cleansing. You know, my wife was part of the, you know, the 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 the, the Muslim minority that was being genocided, being attacked and driven out. She spent two years in a refugee camp. You know, I mean, that, I, and I tell this to people. I go, you guys don't even understand. You've never had a the last foreign occupying force. And you that was in America outside the skirmishing with the Mexicans, you know, in that in that conflict, was the British in the War of eighteen twelve. Okay, prior to that, you know, it was the British again. But since then, outside of our Civil War, you haven't even had a foreign troop here. Yeah, a hundred and you know, almost two hundred years. I mean, there's people that are literally every year wondering, is this tribe coming back to massacre us? Is this is this group of religious zealots coming through here to massacre us? And take everything. Mm-hmm. That was the general worry for the a huge portion of the earth. I mean, basically everybody, you know, at, up until the late, the 21st century. Yeah, that's crazy to think about. Where modern nukes kept borders in line, you know, and insane amount of food production allowed everyone to stay fed. I mean, every year, there, there's even an era like after the fall of the Western Empire, it's called the era of invasion. Like the entirety of Europe, if you go and find cities you know the ancient you know old part of the cities that are from that era they're all built on top of fucking mountains and cliffs because every year somebody what is it was going to be the vandals from north africa what it was going to be the franks what it was going to be the you know whatever kind of ostrogoth or whatever was around was going to come they're going to come take everything from you Mm -hmm. there was no empire to protect us anymore there were no police officers nothing (laughs) so this philosophy that you've developed as a coach obviously it your fighting career played a part in developing that philosophy. For sure. You know, and I, you know, having such a traditional background, you know, and I had instructors that were, you know, for promotional things, you didn't just have to know the technique you had. I had to learn, like when I did traditional Kung Fu, I had to learn to count to 100 in Chinese. I had to do, part of my promotion was an art project. I had to do something in traditional Chinese, from that era, Chinese, you know, whatever I wanted. You know, I took an old gourd and I painted, you know, calligraphy on it. You know, that was probably looked pretty cool. Um, so there was that tradition. It was like more, you know, why was this so important culturally as it was just martially, you know? 
these people held status. So, so the way I look at these guys is like, you're you're learning skills that do put you in a higher like to raise your status. As people look look at anybody, this is why we admire knights and why we admire the the Spartans and all the, and these ancient warrior cults and everything like that and, and uh, cultures. It's because we understand in the real world these skills are hugely beneficial. You know, it's it's like uh, what I tell guys is like, listen, you can get in shape, you can get out of shape all the time. If I teach you these techniques and you really learn them, you have them forever forever really forever and and when you cultivate the mind that goes with that you know it's like the spider-man uncle ben thing you know with great power comes great responsibility you also got to cultivate them their characters to understand and, and when you put a historical context to realize you're not special in this you're not the first guy that's done this there was people that were famous you know Warriors that have that have names have surpassed time. Their bones are dust, yet their names still are with us. You would rather try to be like that guy or just the lone guy that thinks he's a tough guy walking around. I mean, the mission with us at our gym is really to build warriors. I don't build fighters. Any schmuck in a bar can be a can throw a punch and call himself a fighter. He's not going to call himself a warrior. Because there's a there's a character and intellectual context that goes with that term. You know Discipline. Right. But so you started, I think you said you started at eight, third grade or th age yeah. three? Third grade. Third grade. So, so what did you start in third? What was so I started with like a really quick timeline? I started in Ishinru Karate, did that for a few years. And that was your parents who put you in that or you yeah, had and interest? Yeah, and then it was a uh, uh, buddy I grew up, his dad was an instructor, so I kind of was with them. And then I went into uh, about freshman year in high school. I found traditional Southern Mantis Kung Fu, which, you know, which what I liked about it was it was not like what you see in the, the movies. It wasn't very Bruce flamboyant. Lee. It wasn't jump kicking. It was very aggressive hand. You know, I would say eighty percent were hand techniques, small kicking, low you know, low kicking to the knees and stuff. So it wasn't this really fancy waving hand martial art it was a really fighting martial art really and it really developed um what we call my like intent when you throw when you throw things the intent you at which you throw them determines a lot about how that technique pulls off if you kind of just half ass it's going to be half assed if your intent is to hit the guy and do damage the strike will hit harder than if you're just throwing a punch at it you know so intent matters so i learned a lot from this traditional martial art that i because that's really the so much of the technique, but more of the philosophical aspect that I took from it is how I've kind of took the traditional side and put it into modern MMA, which doesn't have, you know, even the jiu-jitsu side, which would be the most martial art of it with the traditional, you know, with the gi and the belt, still lacks because of that divide in jiu-jitsu itself between the martial side and the sports side. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like... Jiu-Jitsu, I mean, this was the beef that Helio had with the family was I created a martial art, and you're turning it into a sport. Because just like, you know, what you can do in a tournament, you cannot do in a fight. So, it was, you know, that's why they was like, why are you even doing it then? Because this whole art march, this whole Jiu-Jitsu I didn't even know about, about this. Helio yeah. was upset with the family? Yeah, so because the, the family divided along those lines of guys that said we should, you know, they wanted we should to make money off this. I mean, we yeah, I mean, that's really and... what it was. I mean, but and... you can't necessarily fault the guy for that. No, and, and I, but that's but that's where it is. You know, that was his idea of like, it's kind of like what you see Taekwondo turned into. I mean, Taekwondo, one invented, was meant to kill you. And now there it's... was no other. There was no idea of <laughs> self defense. <clears throat> that is a modern Western term thrown out to make reluctant mothers feel more secure with sending their kid to learn techniques that are supposed to kill somebody well if he's just defending himself then it'll be then it's okay well it's like if you're defending are you not fighting if i'm defending myself against a man attacking me am i not trying to physically do him harm back yeah. to stop him well what is that yeah i'm fighting you i'm, I'm not fighting. defending you. and that just click in your head determines the the your the way you go and kind of go about your training you know i i always tell my guys i go you guys don't understand when you go train with other people you're going to see we are much more aggressive than most 
jujitsu gyms will be because you have a, I can continually keep the fight connotation in their head. So even when we do jujitsu, a lot of the times it's with MMA gloves and I'm showing them how to utilize strikes to facilitate your grappling. It is a completely different story, especially if you take a pure jujitsu guy who's never done that, throw him in and he can be a high level guy, brown belt. I'll put him with Won't four matter. stripe blue belts with my guys. If there's strikes, I always say every time you get punched, you lose a stripe. How many times you got to hit a black belt before he's a white belt? It's not a lot, yeah. <laughs> right? Before he just curls up, doesn't know what to do. Um, so, I mean, that's... Well, it's a completely different game you had the striking game. Yeah. Like you said, it's the most basic things we see in the UFC, like in the in, even in the highest level fights. I, 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 I couldn't even think of a time where I saw anything other than those five main ones that you said. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, when it, and when it happens, it makes news. Yeah. Because it's that rare. Yeah, it's a big highlight reel. Right. Right. It's that rare. Um, after this, what, what was it called? Kung Fu? Something mm-hmm, Kung Fu? Mm-hmm. So then I went into Southern Mantis. So then I went and right. I joined the military. Um, I was stationed in Germany. I deployed to Iraq. And what age are you? How old are so you? So I, I was, how old was I when I graduated high school? 19? 18? 18. 18. 18. I turned 19 in basic training. I turned 20 at Oktoberfest in Germany because that's where I was stationed. And I turned 21 in Baghdad. So I had those like incremental birthdays. What was the choice to go in the Army? Uh, I come from a family of veterans. So like there's been someone in my family in almost every U.S. conflict back to World War I. Um, my grandfather was highly decorated. He had Silver Star, three pur- two or three Purple Hearts. I think it was two Purple Hearts. Um, my father was in during the Vietnam era. He never deployed, but he was in. I had cousins that were fighter pilots, you know, Marines. And then and I, so it was kind of like a tradition. I always wanted to do it since I was a kid. My, I listened to my grandfather's stories, you know, stories that he shouldn't probably have told. A 10 year old, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like hearing some. Yeah, Whoa. Grandpa didn't, grandpa didn't pull back. Yeah, he'd, he'd be sitting at the kitchen table. <laughs> That's one thing about old men, man. <laughs> sitting at the kitchen table smoking a cigarette. And he'd look straight out the window and be like, Grandpa, tell me your war story. You'd see just like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> shit that came out of his mouth. I was like, wow. <laughs> so that was part of the reason. I always had a plan. I wanted to go in the Army, get out, and become a fireman. Were you a good student? You know, I was, I'll say a, I was a, I want to say I was a smart kid. I could have done a ton better. You know, <laughs> I had never did school. I, I could, like I say, I never do homework, but I could ace my tests. Right. So, like, my teacher. It's good and like, bad. Yeah, exactly. So. I was kind of the same way. I was, I was a procrastinator. So, like, horrible. Homework Horrible habit. Me. Yeah, horrible <laughs> habit of procrastinating. But I always aced everything. So, I was just reinforcing the fact that I can wait to last minute and still do For well. For sure. So, it's like, well, why am I going to work any harder than I need to if I'm still getting my A's? Right. Like My I thing was I was um all I got to do is graduate because I'm joining the army. That's all I cared about. Yeah, and it's I nice said, knowing that. Yeah, for sure. So that was, I think I you know I averaged like a C, whatever. Uh, C's get degrees. Yep, exactly. C's get degrees for sure. Especially everything that I know now about like school and and how I feel about the way school is like cares about those grades no man nobody is asking about what i got on my final paper my 10 page paper my business analysis review class of this and that like nobody gives a shit zero yeah so the stress uh, these kids man they'll come to me like oh i got this final tomorrow i gotta study all day i'm like just study enough yeah you don't need to study all day like no you're not you aren't gonna give a shit about this final in two weeks i mean i remember when i had the majority of my fights because you know my profession, I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic. Um, so I remember I'd be, when I was actually fighting, I was to, had the majority of my fights during paramedic school, which anybody that's been through paramedic school would be like, you're an idiot, Brutal. dude. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's even worse now, but it was like 75% was a failing grade on a test. You know, so well, I you're be, saving lives. I mean, for sure. I mean, you got to have. I understand the quality. You know? Yeah, I understand. But it's like you know when you got a final like that and then a fight the same week. <laughs> like, I was thinking to myself, like, what I was doing. I mean, obviously, it was a thing. It worked. Yeah, being freshly back from the war, I needed to basically inundate myself and everything to keep off the bad path. But um, yeah, when I hear guys kind of complain, it's like, well, if I can do it, dude, that was working paramedic school and training four fights at the same time so it's like you can do it it's it's really what you want right you know how you've been raised how how was so what was your role in in the war like what was your 
So initially, what I signed up for was to be a, an M1 armored crewman, so a tank tank guy. Um, I went to Fort you M signed up for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how it works. So, so that's yeah, why. you can get a you know you find you contracts. Like, you can go. I want to be infantry. I want to be this. You know, I wanted to be in a combat arms unit, but I didn't want to walk everywhere. So I was like, oh, tanks sound good. My uncle was a tanker. Um, so I signed up. I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, did basic and you know OSET training. It's called. Um, and then I requested to be stationed in Germany. I wanted to be stationed overseas. So Why is I, that? Because I wanted to travel. travel I wanted to yep. see the world. Um, and I figured this was the best way, the easiest way to do it. And they still had armor units in Germany at the time. They're all gone now. Um, they've all been redeployed back to the United States. Because this was, you know, the end of the... This is in the 2001 right. is when I joined. So... The Cold War, Cold War remnants were still there. Germany would, had been the hot spot forever. That's usually be where all the new technological stuff went to. Now, by the time I got there, it was basically the bastard stepchild of the military, and everything was the old junk everyone had. So, but it was fun, you know. I lived, you know, in northern Germany. I was like an hour north of Frankfurt. Um, so, like, if you had a cool sergeant, you didn't have a bunch of knuckleheads and weren't in trouble, they'd sign a mileage pass for you, and you could go take off. They had these MWR trips, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. They were at, like, the Burger King on post. Just a flyer. And you could go to, like, Spain for four days, travel, hotel, f two meals a day, and it cost you, like, 40 bucks. Damn. And the military would pick up the rest. You know, so these guys, there was guys that were there for three, four years, never left the fucking town they were in. Didn't go do anything. Like, it was crazy. Like, I was, like, I was lucky. I was a younger guy, but there, my squad had a... Older dudes, they were like their mid twenties, um, that traveled a lot. So like they had already been doing it, they knew how to do it. So they were like, "Are you coming with us, man?" So like I had a, That's cool. you know, I went to seventeen countries or something like that. Super cool. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> then when things started churning up after, because I was in basic training, I was on the, <laughs> I was on the qualifying the first time on my rifle when nine eleven happened. So I was already I joined pre nine eleven. I had been in one month when the towers got brought down, and I'm in basic training when it happened. So I was basically always on a war footing from right off the rip when I, with my right, military service. Right, because there was no war prior to that. Just, I mean, you had, you had the Bosnia, you had Kosovo prior to that, but you, the last one where it was really fighting was Desert Storm. So, right. You know, those, those, a lot of my drill sergeants were Desert Storm guys. They, that was like 10 years prior. You know, because it was 91 when that happened. This was 2001 when I'm in. So I go to Germany and uh, had a blast there. But I kind of knew what, what was going down when they crammed basically a year's worth of training in like three months. Like we, I got there and basically went to the field for three months. And it was like, what is that? And every guy there's like, nah, this is not normal. And then we started getting shit refurbished. Was basically, mm. money started coming to our mm -hmm. units, and these mm -hmm. are like, "This ain't good, dude." Like, I mean, there We're was no even talk somewhere. of Iraq at this time. Weird how they kind of knew to start building it up when Weird. the Afghanistan conflict was literally only like four months old. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, why are they building up a tank unit? Didn't they learn from the Russians that armor's not going to work in Afghanistan? They're like, "Yeah, it's ain't for Afghanistan." And I'm 20 at 20 years old at the time, you know. Don't know shit. Totally bought into all of it, the propaganda. Um, so then we deployed uh, to Iraq in uh, May of 03. So this is the first first OIF-1, it's called. We were relieving 3rd ID, you know, coming into Baghdad and and then just <laughs> the 15 months of chaos, basically, and... I don't know how deep you want me to go into uh, that. Yeah, I was, I was just about... I was thinking in my head, like, what do I want to ask him? I mean, a big part of, I think, the way I think, too, is being a combat veteran um, that had been in, act, you know, in actual engagements with the enemy, it's like I, I knew what kept me in place, you know, the training that how basically to switch your mind off and rely 100% on your training. Um, it wasn't until after things when you came back and you realized the magnitude of the event that you just were involved with would kick in and you'd be, you know, you'd have a, you'd break down a little bit, but it was like, I understood how important that training was in my, my ability to survive. And you had a brief version of it. You didn't have the full version. It sounds like you had a shortened version of the training. Yeah. I mean, in reality, like as, as the way a, 
a tank guy is supposed to fight is completely different than the way an infantryman is supposed to fight. When you got there, basically the tanks were, for the most part, not feasible to use on a daily, you know, in the in a major met, you know city like Baghdad, where roads. I mean, you're talking about something that's been inhabited for thousands of years, continually. That roads had that had once the main arteries of roads that used to be for ox carts, are now just trying to drive a tank down it. It just wasn't ended up being not feasible to use all the time. So and you just, were still a tank guy. Yeah, but it was weird because I had gotten so I went from the tank unit. This is why I had like a I had a very interesting military okay career. So I went from a, being in a tank unit and got ta- got assigned to a military intelligence group. To drive there, they have these bullshit armored vehicles that they're supposed to run. They were never going to go anywhere, so it parked. I, basically, I'm a combat arms guy with military intelligence guys at the headquarters company. Kind of like, what do I do? You know, there wasn't really much for me to do, so I was allowed to start volunteering myself off to other units that were coming in and out, whether for convoys, going out with the scouts. You know, they just because I was. I had a 240 machine gun. I was that was my assigned weapon, a 240. You know, like and the new version of the M60, like fucking Rambo. So anybody that saw me and they said they're like, dude, bring him with. <laughs> you know, like and I, you know, I was cool under pressure and I didn't fuck around. You know, so when you're out there, those are the guys you want with you. And I just was put me in the street. I didn't give a shit. What sort know? of role did like the kung fu and stuff play with that fact that you were cool under pressure? Would you would you attribute a lot of that to the kung fu and the background? Well, I think just martial arts. I think knowing. The fact that if I had to, because a lot of in Iraq in the beginning, it was insane because you, you go through a market square and there's eight of you and you're in the middle of a market square, 1500 people that are all looking at you. That's like, terrifying. And I, there's, a, I got a photo of, you know, combat Kramer took and it's me, it's back shot of me on these Humvees that weren't up armored's. They were soft skin hungry. They didn't. I mean, we went into this war just it was a joke. The the kind of shit we had, and it's me overlooking a crowd, and there's hundreds of people in this crowd, and you could look at this picture and see like eighty percent are looking at you, just staring at you. Yeah. And when you look at a lot of these guys, you're like, there ain't nothing going on up there, but bad intentions, you know. So what are you? How are you supposed to look? Well, so you yeah. know, you got to. What gotta, was the perception of of us being there? Like, did, did people like you? Did you guys have a relationship with the locals? For sure. Like, um, they, I'll tell you what. I mean, some of these Iraqi people, they were some of the most polite and generous people you'd ever meet in your life. I think they had they had realized after Saddam had been gone for quite a bit of time <clears throat> and the fighting had continued and now new things, ISIS and all these other you know, militias were starting to form and doing, starting to war with each other. And like, now they're not attacking U.S. troops, they're attacking each other. And there was multiple times where trucks of would pull into these market squares and dump 20 bodies out into the market square, all chopped up. And it wasn't, you know. Wasn't, wasn't the us. U.S.? Yeah, it wasn't us that did it. It was, so I mean. So they saw a need for you. Well, I don't even know. I think they started to resent it because this was only happening because we were there. Uh. Saddam kept it all in line. Say what you want about dictators in, in that part of the world. Be honest with yourself. Strong men are needed to to having an semblance of normalcy. Like people don't. All you have to do is look at Libya after Gaddafi was killed. You went from a country that, at that point, or just prior, had one of the highest standards of living in all of Africa. Okay. Most some of the most freedoms for women, um, infrastructure, all these kind of things, education. It went from that till after Hillary Clinton's madness to a place that now had open air slave markets, human slave markets. <laughs> Just like that. That's crazy. With one man being removed. Okay, so this, I mean, Saddam, whatever you say you want, electricity, they had electricity, they had plumbing, they had education, they had universities. Christians could live freely without fear. There was hundreds of thousands of them. There was peace between the Shias and the Sunnis. Whether it was a begrudging peace didn't matter. There was no Al-Qaeda. There was none of these Salafis and these Wahhabi, Jihadi guys 
so Saddam you think this didn't was, play with them. He didn't play around with those guys. You think that came as a result of the U.S. entering? Hundred percent. I mean, we can. I mean, you're looking at. You know, we're getting into this these weeds. It's when you start to understand, even remotely, start to study what color revolutions are and how Western intelligence agencies overthrow governments. I mean. Why did we go to Iraq? What was the main idea? The terrorism. What else, though? Oil. Weapons of what? Mass destruction. Did they exist? Complete no. and utter lie that they knew. That after an event like 9-11, where everybody was ready to go, I was one of them, uh, you could get them to do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you could get the population to do anything. When you've scared them Fear. just enough. Of course, the most powerful one. Well, Is that not terrorism? Look at COVID. Oh. I mean. Yeah, what's you, your I, what's your brief paraphrase take on COVID? We talk, mean, we've talked about it several yeah, times. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean. You're obviously vaccinated and double boosted. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a difficult thing for me with my profession. You know, at first. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, first we were lauded as heroes and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, everyone's staying home, but you guys can't. You're amazing. And then as soon as the vaccine hysteria whipped up, now it was, well, if you don't get... Now, remember, we had been through the the, the heaviest wave of it. Mm -hmm. The very beginning was always the worst, you know. And by the end of it, we were public enemy number one if you didn't do it, you know. So you did not do it, correct? I did not, no. And... You know, at least our department, which I won't, re you know, say where I'm, what department I'm, but our chief and everyone in our union was very sensitive to the fact that a vast majority, almost half the department was not for this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if the police in our town didn't mask, didn't vax, didn't do anything. I don't think any police did. I know a lot of, they stood tall on that one, but they made it to where you had to do the once a week thing and. That they'd pay for the spit and, test and the, uh, you know, it wasn't gonna. We weren't gonna let them push it past that. So, but like I said, you had. I mean, if like I said, if you've seen this, if you watch the whole thing come down and are honest with yourself, because I remember thinking like, if this is as crazy as it is, this disease is what it is. How are they allowing us to go anywhere? You know, you can you can go buy an orange from Walmart, but you can't buy it from Joe's Fruit Shack. Mm hmm. If that's when I was like, mm, you know, the local butcher can't sell you steak, but Aldi can. You the, know, what, what really triggered me, and, and when I say triggered, I mean like it, like I was like, I started asking a ton of questions. I was like, why are they trying so hard to get you to take this vaccine? Mm -hmm. Because if it works, if it's effective, if it's saving lives, why would you need to propagandize it? As much you. as they did and not threatened. Just, yeah, not even just propaganda. You're not going to be like. Coerce you. Yeah. We, <laughs> what hey, that, go uh, get a. Hey, I mean, and everybody was on it. Fuck Krispy Kreme. We'll give you a free donut. We'll you free if you, donuts. I mean, this, can you imagine? That's what you. you I got it because they gave um, you a donut. Mayor like, de Blasi, he was eating the burger yeah. and fries. He was like, mm, you, want, you want this? You mean I can get this burger, burger and fries? fries? Yeah. Is it too early to eat this burger and fries? Oh. God, you guys got to get right. mm. Jesus Christ. For sure. Like, that was the most bizarre thing Everything. I have ever seen. When I watched people staring through glass at their family members. Hugging I mean, each other through plastic. They would put plastic over their whole entire bodies, face included. If that wasn't a and they would hug proven each other. fact, that psychological operations are being run on you constantly. And now, like another part, I worked with psychological operations guys. And we went out, they'd always need, there was, there's a smaller number of them, but they would need guys for security. So, like I said, I'm volunteering for everything. So I'm watching this. And, it, you know, I, the, the military doesn't have thousands of guys with budgets of billions so strictly in the psychological, because the things don't work. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not just putting money because they don't work. Your, your mind is a computer. We do know it is a, you know, Chemical computer, your 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 mind is, and there are buttons that they know how to Absolute push. Absolutely, and fear is a big button. And the way they can just incite words and repeat over and over again to induce certain endorphin releases or anything mm -hmm. like that, 
with buzzwords. This is why you hear those words. Conspiracy this is, theories. This is why they kept that count, that like rolling tally of death on the news every time you, I mean, it's like, this is the shit you say to your kids. If you don't eat that, the boogeyman's going to get you. Well, a kid is like, holy shit. Someone I trust, but it's like, it's someone I trust saying that. It's mom. Now, if you believe in these legacy media outlets and these pundits, it's like your parents are saying it to you. Holy shit, you know. It was scary at first. Uh, right. I'll admit, like, at first when when they were, like, they were essentially saying, you are going to die. There is going to be a huge death toll. And the original model, I think it was out of the UK, Alex. Yeah. You'd probably know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it was, like, th- one in five people. Yeah, it was, like... One in five people are going to die. That was the original model. Yeah, and, then and very the guy, quickly, remember the guy that came up with it? What he yeah, kept? he was... Uh, he got busted screwing around on his wife. Yep, 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 <laughs> Sneaking yep, yep. out of the house. Yep, during the, you didn't see any news on that. Implemented the plan he did. He you didn't see any news on mistress. that? <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, God, How yeah, about was... the fact that, uh, you know, our governor, as soon as he had initiated the lockdowns in Illinois, he's up partying in Wisconsin. Good old Pritzker. And then sends his old lady and family down to Florida. Pritzker is a, a unanimous rule breaker. He does it all the time. I remember he did something with his mansion. Uh, oh, uh, to to he pay bought the less. house next door, tore out all the toilets, tore out the to toilets, condemn it, and then because then, then it was uninhabitable. Well, it put now because he had this shit house, shit house next to his. It dropped his taxes. Right. <laughs> Dude, they don't even care. They do no. it right in front of you. I, mean, I think this is the big thing. What you're seeing now, even more. More than ever, is the veil has been pulled, and they don't even care. No, you know they're they're you you're watching Hunter Biden, classic guy. I mean, but it's like any if you had done one sixteenth of In the jail. crime, you would be locked up, jail. dude. Off to jail. So this guy's not only gallivanting around the world, uh, doing shady business deals. There's also videos. He's, he's inst- I mean, this shows the, the instability of that family that this guy recorded everything. Everything. And the laptop was real. The laptop was supposed to be fake. I mean, I mean, look what you just said. That's what I'm saying. Like, this guy's doing all these crimes. He's basically international human trafficking, drugs, buying guns. Untouchable. Illegally. You know, Untouchable. That's it. And then you have it, and you have the entire media complex defending it. Meanwhile, though, there's a lady in Utah. It looks like she put seven hundred dollars in her bank account. I think we should audit her. Hundred percent. We should audit this lady. And that was like the you know the financial. I feel like that was the biggest thing that kind of probably flipped a lot of people when Trump was first running in 2016. When Hillary said, you know, he cheats on his tax. He doesn't pay taxes, and he says that makes me smart. And he goes, and if she wanted to change it, she would have. But all of her friends that give her all the money use the same the thing. Same she ain't gonna thing. change nothing. So, I mean, the, the, I think what people have seen, how much these politicians, t- which you always knew, everyone always had a hinkling, like, yeah, I don't trust a politician. But now right. it's like, you're seeing they're not just untrustworthy, they are straight up subversives. Like, you want to talk that January 6th was a, usur- a tented usurpation? What have we done? What have these people done to our trading, you know, our trades, our economies, our businesses? I mean, like, look what they did in two years. As soon as... Trump was letting the boot off our neck. That's all it was. It wasn't like we got the chain shattered and we were able to jump up and hook up nitrous oxide and start doing it. No, dude, it literally just removed the book, the boot enough to allow the blood and the air to flow a little bit. And look how fast this country revitalized. Look how fast the middle class revitalized. Everything was so cheap, man. I mean, it just everyone was the entrepreneurship that was able to shoot out that people actually could do something now. Yeah. They couldn't before. And you saw that, how much, because, you know, I I tell people before, the American middle class is unsurpassed around the world, and it's the the economic engine that it is. I mean, you got to think about what we're able to do. We're able to pay for mortgages, pay car payments, you know, pay for schooling, pay for food, pay for extracurricular activities, pay for colleges, hopefully have some that you're still putting away, possibly start business. I mean, that's what American middle class economic engine can do. And this is like when you're talking about people that want neo feudalism in reality. They want a upper noble class and a serfdom class. You know, this is you know, and 
I think it's hard for people to grasp that this kind of evil really exists in the world and that there's people willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want. Normal people that don't act like that, they when they think of evil like that, they think of something out of a comic book, a guy with horns or a dark, devious-looking you know, person that when he walks into the room, you say, that's the bad guy. Just like you see in a movie, like a kid's show. The the villain is always very transparent that he's the villain. Mm-hmm. In, but you look in our world, in the reality of the world, they're the Bill Gateses. They're these scrawny dorks with glasses that walk around in, in, in you know, sweater vests, that those are actually the most evil people in the world. And it's hard for people to grasp that. Like, it has to look like a monster, not realizing the monsters put the shell, you know, it's like in Men in Black. <laughs> it's the skin suit, man. Don't get it all into that. But freaking, that's what you're looking at in, in the world. So I think, like, people now are seeing this well, like, oh, wow, they're... I do think, do you, do you think people are starting to see it more? Because I, I do. I, I don't I do feel like I don't think the Democrats are making more Democrats. Right. And that's it is what it is. I like you say when you see our border just being overran. This is is I mean it's like that oh man, I just don't understand that one man. I I I the how are we not united on this thing? On <laughs> this thing where illegal immigrants and there's a new headline every day about an illegal immigrant raping, killing, hurting committing some sort of felony this is the propaganda machine oh my god dude i mean this is this is how you can tug at people's hearts but i mean it's like almost you have got to the cognitive dissonance that someone has to have to look at that and say this is somehow beneficial to us and you've had less now because of what these gov you know texas governor these other that they're shipping them into your society now You'll never see it. Like, you got to see it when they sent him to Martha's Vineyard. And you got some broad up there that had, I mean, it's like the audacity to say, there's a housing crisis in Martha's Vineyard. What, there's not enough houses with 15 bedrooms available for you? I mean, like, and you saw how fast they scooted them right out of there. Mm -hmm. It's what's good for you, it ain't good for me, man. You know what I'm saying? You ain't going to be in my gated community. I can feel good about myself as long as I don't have to see the peasants. I mean... You're looking at how people can now see what they just did with Trump in this last speech he gave, where he said, if if we don't get and check the auto industry in Mexico with China building these plants down there, he goes, there's going to be, if I don't get in office, there's going to be a bloodbath in the auto I industry. I saw this. They stopped it, he chopped it up. He was referring to the auto industry. 100%. And it was, I, Using yeah. a term that people use. There was, uh, Elon had just responded to someone and they deleted their tweet immediately. Immediately, because it, it, it and oh my god, that's been done with Trump eight hundred million times. I mean, but now it's like now people are seeing the rampant just persecution of the man, and this is what, what's terrifying him is black, especially in the black community. Black men are now identifying with Trump, which they had always before. But you saw the power of propaganda drove him away. Now they're realizing, man, this guy. He's only surviving because he's got six billion dollars, but he's doing the same thing to me. And you're gonna when you drive these people away, you don't get them back. Mm-hmm. They don't tend to flip it hard when you actually, you know, because they open their eyes. This is the ma- This was the whole port of the Matrix movie. Like people ask, you know, I go, well, here's the decision you had to make. You can take the red pill or the blue pill. The red pill means you get to understand that the world you live in is a shitty spaceship that's cold and dark. The food is terrible. You're eating gunk. And you're being pursued by giant robots that want to murder you. That's the reality of the world. Or you can choose to... To ignore it. To ignore it. Go back to your normal life. And pretend as if it's real, as if what is happening is real. And that the actual monsters aren't the ones making that what you think is reality, you know, to you. Like, it's... (laughs) Yeah, that movie, and even now, if you watch it again now, you're just like, holy shit. Like, you don't know if this was, uh, you know, per, you know, programming. What do they call it? Predictive programming or like where they, I mean, Hollywood. Simulation. Hollywood has a CIA officer attached to it. You know, I saw that. is a part of these deals. So was the military. Well, what was the movie that uh, came out with, it was like a virus from a pig and uh, it 
was almost exactly like COVID, where like the vaccine saved the world. Uh, what's that movie called? You know what I'm talking about? Alex? Yeah, it might have been just called like Pandemic. <sighs> no, I can't think of it. There, there's but a it, couple, though. but it wasn't long before COVID happened. Right mm-hmm. after that movie, mm-hmm. so you got it. And you know, it's funny because we can sit here and ask these questions, and then what what happens? Everyone watches this and they goes, "Oh, they're a bunch of conspiracy theorists." I mean, to me, first off, most of these people don't even understand where that term came from. All right. I mean, that was coined up in the, I think, with the Kennedy assassination. And it was literally in the white papers that said, you know, use assets to anybody that questions the official narrative to label them and put it in literally quotes, conspiracy theory. Because right there, it's just a dehumanizing, de-intellectualizing someone to basically say, ah. You know, I've come to say, like, I remember telling guys, Ten years ago, I go. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a day you realize this world is ran by satanic pedophiles, and it was like you could have got you know I couldn't have been the bigger bigger idiot. And then we have Epstein's island, and what was Epstein's island? You know what I'm saying? It was and what was on Epstein's ring. island? A freaking like remake of a Canaanite temple, yeah, Babylonian temple, yeah, on a place where they're doing unseen evil to children, yep. 100% controlled by... And where is the list? Is the list... It's the, only, it's the only thing I've ever heard of where the madam gets arrested and none of the Johns do. How? <laughs> yeah, like, how is there not a list? Like, how do we not know exactly who is on the damn list? By not knowing, you know it's the most important people. Yeah, well, and obviously, I, if Trump was on it, we would have hit... We would have that part of the list. Uh, uh, they yeah. would scratch everyone off and they would highlight Donald Trump was on this list. If you think about it, and I don't know, I care how controversial it sounds. He's got to be one of the most cleanest people in the world. You've had, you've had at this least much opportunity. Every single Western intelligence agency, all these attempts, doing everything they can to con- to dig up anything to convince you to to not support this man. Well, we went from and like he's a Russian spy. Now it's like, well, he tried to evaluate. His property at way too much money. We need to put him in jail. And even that's though, what they even though the bank didn't care, <laughs> that's what and they want to do on? business with him again. I mean, it's every single person with money does that. Every anybody. I mean, you had the guys. They all came out. I mean, you even had that guy from Shark Tank come out and say it like, "Oh, this Kevin is O'Leary, a, yeah, this yeah. is exactly what every yeah, single CNN real estate." On. Yeah, and they were, like, mm. yeah, they were like, "Oh, shut him off." <laughs> He goes, you are going to basically, he goes, I personally now will never invest in New York again. He's like, and the mayor had to go and sit down all basically the business tycoons and say, and literally admit that this was only happening because he was Donald Trump. Donald Trump. We should, oh, we don't want, this was, this, this circumstances was, you know, the circumstances of this case were highly irregular and it's not going to be the norm. <laughs> I mean, what else is, what other <laughs> language do you need to say that, Basically says we are one hundred percent persecuting this man and this man yeah, alone. This is the only <laughs> like, guy. He has special rules. I mean, this is you know, and then I think what you're seeing with the war in Ukraine itself, that our politicians on both sides are willing to take put us in ruinous debt, even more so on the top of the ruinous debt we're in, and completely degrade our military capabilities to support a country that they claim is about saving democracy. And this guy, this president has outlawed elections, jailed every single one of his dis, you know, dissenters. And yet they'll say that Putin's doing the same thing. It's like, well, you're, you, you can't have it both. Mm-hmm. And we're going to give now what over a hundred billion dollars to people. Every single member of that government's buying houses around the world with that money. They're, they're sending their people into a freaking meat grinder. I watched a video that they posted of they literally had a guy with Down syndrome on the front freaking line. And, like, it's the soldiers filming and saying, look, and it's translating under, like, oh, look what they sent us now. They're like, where's your weapon? Hey, oh, you know what? One. I think you like, sent this to I me. I think it probably did. Like, I said, look at this. Yeah. And that's not an act. You, you can me. see him. They're on the freaking front line. He's sitting in a trench. Wow. So it's like. You won't eat, they won't even entertain. This is why they had to villainize Tucker Carlson just for talking to the guy. Say whatever you want about Puntu. He is not a good dude. He has done it. He, I, to me, historically speaking, he's basically a, how everybody is. 
If you think America's <laughs> leaders are not respond, if you think Lindsey Graham has no blood on his freaking hands, that John McCain, the great war hero, who never met a freaking rebel group he would never want or didn't want to send money and weapons to, all right, what are you guys thinking about? Mm -hmm. None of these people that are bought and paid for by entities are, are hold any allegiance to a flag, no matter if they served or not. Right. It means nothing, really. Look at Dan Crenshaw. That psychopath. The great, another guy that served, got wounded, you know, the eye patch. He's trying to, you know, he comes down to the guys, the special forces guy. This guy is a fucking psycho. To, to advocate for the conflicts this maniac wants to go into. It's like you got your face, half your face blown off, dude. You want to send more of us to go do that. What's wrong with you? What do they got on you? This is why yeah. you're starting to realize that people that Start are asking questions. make these decisions. Why? Nikki Haley broke when she leaves office, goes to works for a freaking arms company. Now all of a sudden she's freaking worth $15 million. Alexander Ocasio Cortez, a fucking bartender, and is now worth $15, $14 million because she's smart. <laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy, man. Like the so much, the corruption that is so blatantly in your face, and you're told to just yeah, just deal with it. Loser, shut up, pay your taxes, give us your children. It's a helpless feeling. <laughs> it's extremely helpless, right? Because like, what are you supposed to do? Well, what, now we'll you understand vote. why they've wanted to isolate everyone. Divide and conquer is a time and test trust. You know, time and tested freaking strategy. Caesar's campaigns through Gaul were completely based on it of dividing these tribes to never unify. And when the finally that they put enough of their differences aside to unite, it was too late. And they had been too infiltrated. They had been too overwhelmed militarily that the last gasp they had, yeah, it was, it was a good one, but they just then got ready for 400 years of subjugation of the Romans. Mm -hmm. 400 years, four centuries that one occupier maintained over you. That was because you couldn't unite when you needed to unite. And when they finally did it, it was too late. I mean, this is why they're separating us in on gender, uh, economically, racially, religiously, any to... They don't want one nation. They want they to balkanize want, us. Yeah. That term came from the disintegration of my wife's countries. You know, my wife, that region, the Yugoslavia. They were called the third superpower. It was the United States, the USSR, and Yugoslavia were the main players in this world. And they had a guy that didn't play around with either one, fucked everybody. So they were 100% united under the idea of being Slavs. We were not, because they still had Muslims, Christians, Croats, you know, so Orthodox Christians, you know, all these people had mixed in, and they still got along because the focus was on your Slavic identity, not your religious identity. Well, as soon as that guy died, that their leader died, Right then, they cut it down the lines of Bosniak Muslims, Serbian Orthodox, Cro uh, Croatian Catholics, and how long does it take to get the demagogues to start ramping up everybody? One spark, and then you got a region that once had literacy, women's rights, I'll bet on a lesser scale because you're still in a communist dictatorship. But the fact that you could travel freely with your passport to every country, a unifying group. They had rock music. They had, I mean, and then you just boom. You're, you're within six years, you're in a, a civil war where everyone's slaughtering each other. Your neighbor you knew for 20 years is dragging you out and killing you. It happens like that. Yeah. You know, it takes nothing. I think one of the big reasons, because people are still so bent out of shape about Trump. We actually have a guest coming on on Wednesday. She reached out to us mm -hmm. and she said, I want to talk about how I was totally blinded by legacy media and how mm -hmm. I didn't see it. And now I do. And like, then I was a never Trumper and now I'm not. And she's like a licensed social care worker, I think mm -hmm. something like that. She'll be on Wednesday, but people get so bent out of shape. Like when I say, I'm going to vote, I'm going to vote for Trump. But the reason I'm going to vote for Trump, it's not because I think he's a really cool guy. It's because he's not going to be bought. I mean, he lost money. His net worth went down. He's the only president, and maybe not the only president ever, but when you look on recent years and recent presidents, mm -hmm. he's the only one not 
make more money mm -hmm. from being president. Mm -hmm. And that's what really pushes me towards Trump. That and then this giant push from the system to just destroy him. Like, what is what is I think why what are you he, so what he scared of this guy? I think what he represents to everybody is it's and Trump says it, it's it's not me they're after, it's you. I'm just what's in the way. He's he's the entity that everyone can look at and say they're doing the same thing to me. Yeah. I mean, what is taxation? But theft, in my opinion. Taxation is theft. Slavery. Slavery, 100%. I mean, the, the, I think the greatest trick was convincing us that we're not slaves. <laughs> All right? We are economic slaves, 100%. But the idea that we can go around, and be, it's just like you gave the, sl the slave a hall pass. Mm -hmm. We'll just let him walk around and pretend he's not slaves. Just, you're just in a really big jail cell. You know, you're on the, you know, the prison planet, what they call it. So I think when they see everything happening to Trump... And the only reason he's still alive is because of his wealth, because that is the only way you get justice in this world, is if you have enough zeros in the bank account, that it's like everyone is starting to identify with it. They're trying, wait, they're trying to destroy his businesses now because they don't like him politically? Well, they basically did that to me. You know, I lost everything in that freaking COVID Nazi shit as the same people I watched issuing these laws were then flaunting them in public. Gavin Newsom out there having no mask, no nothing, eating dinner when no one else could go to a Nancy restaurant. Nancy Pelosi getting her hair done. And just the absurdity of the rules. Well, you can I eat mean, like, outside if it's inside looks like a inside. tent. like <laughs> inside. I mean, the amount of data these guys must have been able to generate on what they can make people do. Well, know? and it was all. I mean, I mean, you understand why they made You're right about data. They got yeah. all the data on their on your phone. Oh, 100%. They got they everything they saw exactly who need. the dissenters were. They got exact number of people that are left in this country that are 100% possibly be a threat. I mean, this is why... Well, there was a literal list being created through... I don't know if it was the FBI, but I know there was something about Bank of America giving out information with people who were buying things near and around the January 6th. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I right about this, Alex? Yes. Yeah. So Bank of America was giving out information that I know Bank of America wasn't the only one. Yeah, I think there's some other banks too. Yeah, they were giving out information. I so if you were near or banks. around January 6th, you got thrown on a list for the FBI, if I'm not mistaken. I guarantee if you even put, typed it in on a Facebook or any kind of profile, you got put into a database. Mm -hmm. If you liked a post from somebody that was in support of those guys, you got put in the database. I mean, if you, I mean, Can social you media. With the oh, sorry, pal. I mean, if you look at the history of social media, look at Facebook, okay? Um, these were all DARPA projects. And if you go back to Facebook and look at the launch of Facebook, the date it launched, and then you go back to listen and talk about a DARPA project that was, I believe, called LifeLog. All right? What was it called? LifeLog. The day they shut that project down... The very next day, Facebook launched. Okay, and basically, LifeLog. The whole premise of was, was how do we to log your life? Right, but it was covertly. What some genius came up with said, "Hey, let's let them do it. They'll freaking give you every single thing about their life if you just switch the idea why they're doing it." You know this, <laughs> the way that movie was played off, I and mean, that was the biggest joke in the world. But it was like. We don't even have to say anything. And then we could just put a little question. What's your opinion on this? And you'll get some loud mouth, blah, 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 blah. Give it all. Oh, so it's my like, God, dude. Social can, media is giving rocks to monkeys. Right. And it's a double, but it was a double edged sword now because now, what, in my opinion, what it did is it also linked up people that thought they were alone in a lot of their thinking and realized they're not. And the more, and then it gave them more courage to kind of speak up against things when it started to really hit. You know, I think during that COVID ban, I got banned. I did like seven, eight, thirty day, thirty day bans just for mentioning things. I mean, that's how quick. Boom. So do check your phone today. My log for being banned wiped. Really wiped. Why would it be wiped now? My whole Instagram. I remember sending you a bunch of screenshots nope. for it. My Instagram had this huge long list, misinformation on this day, said this, was we removed this post, blah, blah, blah. It's gone, dude. I have a scot-free record. Why? Because it was all COVID stuff. 
It was all COVID stuff. It was all vaccine stuff. And it, I turned out I was right. So they had to get rid of that information. Good thing I have screenshots of it. Well, there was because now there's litigation in happening. And they're losing cases yep. where people's rights were infringed and they're getting money. Well, there's got to <laughs> be a case for me, man. There's got to be because... There, there's a case for the half of freaking America. Right. Because if you're going to shadow ban my account, then Why do you I think they have laws? Why do you think they made the guys they donate to pass laws that say they can't be sued? The same way the pharmacy companies did. Yeah, that was... Uh, They've paid out billions. Like People think like, they're, like it, it, there's billions of dollars shelled out to that exact thing. You know, and I'm not going to sit here because, you know, being in the healthcare system, there have been vaccines that obviously have changed the world. I mean, polio, smallpox, these things killed millions. But the whole development process, the way they went about it, well, someone was completely saw, different. Someone saw dollar signs. Of course. And they're like, you know what? Let's put up. Let the, the, we, could, we could vaccinate for everything. If you looked at our grandparents, they got maybe two. They got a polio and a smallpox vaccine. And they're alive. And they lived all to their late age. And that's smoking and drinking and freaking putting lard on everything. You know, these mm -hmm. people still were that hardy. If you look at just the count of how many shots a kid gets before 18 now, it's like almost 100. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I mean, come on. There's a reason they don't let you see the warning label. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we really? You know, I, I remember turning down that Hep B one. And the lady's like, well... This is the example she used, and the doctor's like, well, there was a child that was in a car accident, and blood from one of the parents who had Hep B splattered on him, and he got Hep B. I said, well, last time I checked, I'm not an IV drug user or involved in kind of things that are going to get me in Hep B, mm -hmm. all right? I was like, look, I was like, that's your only example? And, and she got all uptight about it. Like, well, I'll just... I'll, I'll... Well, they're conditioned. Dude, look at... They Richard, get money for it. Look at the time. opioid pandemic with Richard Saxler and the Saxler family. The playbook is there. Everyone pays the doctors. The doctors push whatever pharma, pharma pays them. Mm -hmm. This includes vaccines. Mm -hmm. Doctors get bonuses on vaccines. How do you not ask questions at that point if it's for the betterment of health? Because I got a hundred eighty thousand dollars in college debt. <laughs> you know that's what they're thinking. I mean the. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't see, you've been to doctors your whole life, flu season, all that. You never saw a doctor wearing a face mask, a face shield, gloves. I mean, they. But it stops the most deadly virus we have ever seen. Yes. The mask. Yes. Uh, your mother's, you know, homemade cheetah print cloth over her face. It's stopping. Stop. <laughs> also, don't forget, you might be asymptomatic. You might not even know you have the deadliest virus well, listen, in the world. I mean, dude, it was pure madness. Madness. Like, and Bonkers. To be that guy that was trying to bucket, because I remember, you know, going to these, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear a mask. The looks you would get from people like, no, how dare you? I mean, they would come at you, have the audacity to come up to you in public. How dare you? It's like I always would say, I thought that thing works. What do you care? Yeah. You know, you'd have to look in the mirror every day and decide, you know, I choose violence today just by not wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. I choose that I'm going to be harassed and confronted by people yep. who most likely I could, in a physical confrontation, utterly destroy. But I'm going to have to sit there and listen to you spout literally <laughs> big pharma propaganda to me based in truth with the eye, with the i could see in your eye you would want to do physical harm to me if you could that's that is, what dude that's true <laughs> yeah. that's true i remember cuz i would whenever i was with my wife or my family i would wear a mask because i'm it's not i don't want to make other people that i care about uncomfortable okay so when i was with kelsey she didn't like me making a scene. I did it one time. She didn't like it. I was like, all right, I'm done. I won't do that. And then every time I was alone, I would walk in a mire, and I would walk in without a mask. I would get one of these and one of these. They would try to hand me a mask. I would say, no, thank you, and I would just walk right by. And the disgust, yeah. surprise, like crazy, man. It definitely helps that I'm larger, mm -hmm. so less people wanted to come up to me. But there was one guy one day. I walked into mire. He's like, sir, you need a mask. I was like, you have one, so you're fine. Looks like everyone else is wearing them, so like, if they work, we're good. And I went on my way, and he followed me throughout Meyer, walking on his little thing, 
And then he followed me out and he tried to lecture me on why I can't come in next time if I don't wear a mask. I was like, okay, call the cops. And I never made a big deal out of mm-hmm. it. But you can tell he wanted something bad to happen to 100%. me. 100%. I never thought about it that yeah. way. I could look, I could see, I know when I can see people's intents in their eyes. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm almost a subject matter expert on it, being in the professions I've been in. I know when someone's going to want to do me harm just by looking at you. All right. The way your body postures, the glint in your eye, everything. All right. And it's like if these people were capable and thought they could get away with it, they would most definitely try to do you harm for the simple fact. Or just wish harm. <laughs> wish harm. Yeah. For the simple fact that you did not want to kowtow to blatant propaganda. Well, it's got to be hard now, too. Like, because I know friends have reached out to me and told me how stupid they felt. Mm -hmm. They have. Most haven't. And which is fine. But you got to feel so stupid. You got to feel so stupid. Especially the ones that were like, Steve, I just don't understand why you won't wear a mask. Well, it's not doing We'll get to why you don't understand later, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Like, like there's, there's a lot you don't understand. There's there were conversations that I had where it was like, you guys, oh my god. I told I told the smoking one, I'll tell you really quick. I had someone, I don't want anyone yeah. to feel like they're called out, sat across from me at a bonfire smoking a cigarette, telling me, he's like, I just think you're putting your family in danger not getting this vaccine. Smoking the the, the number one cancer causing thing in the world. And then similarly. I was supposed to play golf with people, and my vaccine status was shared, even though I never outright shared it with them. (laughs) So he's like, hey, just want to let you know I shared that you didn't get vaccinated, and uh, the other guys were uncomfortable, so we're not going to play golf today. And I'm like, wait a second. Be like, thank, One, thank you for exposing yourself to you me. You just that. shared Goodbye. my private <laughs> yeah. medical information. Hippo, you ever heard and of number two, we're outside in the sun. Fresh air. Like, you guys can wear your mask. You keep a distance. You won't play golf with me? That's, yes, yes, exactly, yes. That's insane, <laughs> dude. Yeah. That is crazy. Especially now. Especially now. Like, then it was like, they seriously thought that was normal. They seriously thought, like, we're doing the right thing. We're protecting ourselves. Yeah. And I asked him, I was like, wait, but aren't you and everyone else vaccinated? He's like, well, yeah, but we're just trying to be safe. I was like, you did the right thing to be safe. Right? You got vaccinated. Didn't you? Yeah. So I'm the one who's in danger, correct? Right. He's From like, you. well, I'm not sure that's how it From works. From you, because you could still give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's how it works, Steve. <laughs> All right. But it's it. it the, you can't. What I found. You cannot argue facts and analysis with people that find this crazy, like, moral superiority in their ignorance. 100%. In their, like, so ignorant. Like, I don't don't want to be wrong. I don't want to know that I'm wrong. I don't even want to question the idea that I might be wrong. It takes a lot of courage to look in the mirror and say you got duped. And I think that's a huge part of why people... While they're not vocal anymore, they're not going to come up and apologize either. Mm-hmm. Say, "Hey, man, you know." I, and I don't, I don't necessarily need that. You don't need it, but it's like it's almost someone. If you, if this person, if you guys had a close relationship and they had done something like that to you, you would hope that they'd have enough self-respect and enough uh, compassion and courtesy towards you, realizing they did something wrong, and come, "Hey, man, you know what? You were right." But just to say that you were right, I was wrong takes a certain amount of courage Mm -hmm. and and character, really. Um, Well, you got to dig deep to say something like that. For sure. And when when you have a world now that is 100% geared towards narcissism, which is the whole point of social media was to create narcissists and people in depressed or depression. Because especially with these, the girls, the women, because women tend to go with the flow a lot more than men do. We'll buck the system. Women don't. It's just in their nature to do that. And I don't give a shit what anybody says. That's biology. Okay? Well, we can go that whole... No, I... I no, right, I, that whole idea of why that's being... Men fucked. and women are different. That's that's all that we need to say about that right now. And, it, and, it's, and it's been proven time and time. That's how they survived. Okay? You didn't... You didn't no boss bitches existed prior towards the 21st century. 
and I say that outside, everyone, oh, there was queens. And queens. Yeah, they were a very small minority, and there's even a smaller minority that had world impacts, okay, just of, of who they were by their own force of will. Most women, if you didn't comply, you became, I mean, when you, people came through and they killed an army, they took the women and the children, all right? If you wanted to survive that captivity and possibly be assimilated into the next tribe, you were going to comply with what they said. You weren't going to fight back. Anyone that fought back got dealt with. And how many people do you need brains do you need to see get smashed in in front of you for you to say, mm, I'm not going to mess with him. What do you need me to do? What language do you need me to learn? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Who, what God do you need me to pray with? Just don't kill me and my kid. Yeah. That's just how it went. Well, it's, 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 it's so funny how you can say men and women are different and you can talk about the obvious differences, but you get labeled as this sexist misogynist person now and there is this clear push to make women like you said boss bitches boss bitches on social media it's we don't create, need men it's to create masculine women and feminine men and by doing that this reason you'll the chaos that causes the collapse of the family that will happen from it and you know they use the words patriarchy and all these things like that but look what i in my opinion look what less of a patriarchy has done only fans would Proud that have fathers. existed twenty years ago? Come on, man! They're just empowering themselves. I mean, it's. I mean, that's the. That's where we in, or we are today. Where prostitution, which is what it is, it's called is sex being, work. It's called yes. I mean, just these <laughs> labels, <laughs> you know, are are uh, are being lauded. So if that's something that, that that you know, I always you know I've had these conversations i believe women's legacies are their families they're not jobs they don't no one gives a shit about did you know sorry finish go ahead finish <laughs> but i'm saying. just saying that's what it is it's like your children are when you when someone sees parents and they see their kids especially if they're growing and they're all doing well that brings status to me and i i look at something like that they obviously know what the hell they're doing that's a good mother that's a good woman that was a good dad. They worked well as a team together because obviously they raised four upstanding, you know, kids that are now have their own families. They're going to continue that line. But yeah. Did not you... not five baby daddies, six kids waiting on the government to pay for you. I mean, and that's, you know, that's whoa, that's something that's achievable. She she done her thing. She didn't need no man. Yeah, it's madness, man. It really is. To go back to this only fan, only fans thing, I learned this the other day. Did you know, Alex? I wanted to talk to you about this too. There is a tip sheet on OnlyFans now. So basically, what you can do is you can list actions and and things like that you would do for your viewer or your subscription service, and you put a dollar amount next to it, and someone could just say select. <clears throat> so like, there's tip sheets. There was a couple floating around the internet. It was like. I will take a bath, videotape it, bottle up my bath water, and send it to you. The simp culture we got, man, is is part of the problem. That there's these guys out there that, I mean, there's plenty of dudes speaking on this stuff and obviously having large audiences when they're talking about these guys that, ex, you know, accepting this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, I don't know, that women are promoting it, the fact that know that it was femin that feminists are the ones that are are lauding these men going into women's sports it's i mean it's like <laughs> everything's turned on its head you've got to start to believe in that's for a reason mm -hmm. i think there i was watching a guy talking about how where the turn all these buzzwords transgenderism races all these things started going super hyperbolic it all happened basically like in 2012 where none of these terms in the lexicon were even popping up very rarely and then out of nowhere, within one month, they all just skyrocket in use. Now you're gonna try to say no one flipped a switch, and and with their uh, knowing now that the media, and these newspapers and these, you know, media conglomerates are all writing a script. I mean, there's a hundred montages out there of all the local newspapers saying the people. exact same I thing mean, verbatim. I mean, it's fucking crazy, man. It's cutting, and they're from Ohio to Hawaii. To, I mean, it's every single state. Reading the same script. Well, we know too because of Hunter Biden that not only are, are the media jumping in with each other, but the government and social media are playing side by side. Hundred percent. The government said, "Hey, Zuck, 
we want you to censor this Hunter Biden story. We don't know what's going on. So we want you to censor the story. And that was prior to Joe Biden being, being elected. But so, this Russian collusion one, we want you to literally ramp it up, ramp it up, and then ramp block anyone that tries to have a counterpoint. So it's 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 just it's really tough for me, and I I hate saying right and left because now in today's day and age, you say right, immediately you're put into this box. Just like when you're not wearing a mask, you're put into a box. You say left immediately, and I will admit, if someone says they're on the left, I have a hard time not putting someone in a box. I do. So I and it's a big reason I want this podcast too. I want – I've had pretty much just people on the right on the show, but I, I do want to line up some people on the left. Do I think they're going to be as willing as people on the right? No. But I still want them to come on the show because conversation is the mediator. Conversation is what we need to bring people back together because we are one effing nation. Mm-hmm. We are one nation. We are all – we could be black. We could be white. We could be Asian. We could be whatever color as long as we're all Americans together. Borders, language, and culture are what make a country. And if you deprive or, or usurp any of those things, any of those things, what do you get? You get what we've seen now. Any single thing that was a unifying force in America has been de- desecrated and degraded. This is the reason why the national anthem, which is about free, you know, you know what I'm saying, has to be destroyed. The fact that there any of these NFL teams and have balked to this quote black national anthem is an absolute atrocity in my book that is a unifying fact of america that is the thing we sing the flag is something that unifies us and our language is something that unifies us and then the border if there's if people can just freely come and go then there's nothing that separates us and people oh we shouldn't be separate bullshit and don't ever tell me that there's not cultures that are more superior to other cultures okay i don't give a shit what anyone says the aztec culture was pretty fucking evil if you believe that cutting out the hearts of kids to, to you know, appease a sun deity on a scale. You're sacrificing life. Ripping it out as they're alive. And you're going to try to say that's, that's the same as, you know, uh, the Christian nations that have built the most peaceable places on earth. I mean, eh, I'm not going to agree with you there, dude. I can because there's evidence that shows the counter to it. So this is how you can understand why if we can get these people broken up in so many small groups where they don't even believe this is why you can go to like San Francisco they, you, they on their voting ballots it's like in 40 languages. <laughs> like assimilation or immigration without assimilation equals destruction. All right? Even the fact that Rome was you know, had 40 to 50 million people under the reign of the Caesars from all over the world, there still was a unifying idea of what it was to be Roman. And by the end of it, when Italian local, you know, uh, native Italians weren't even fighting, weren't even the emperors anymore. It was all being done by provincials. Some of the most decisive and uh, capable emperors that literally saved Rome from falling centuries before it should have weren't even from Italy. But they had a unifying idea of what it was to be Roman and the ideals and the culture. They embraced it because they knew where they come from. Without Rome, it was going to be absolute chaos. And you can try to tell me without America that the world will somehow be a better and more peaceful place, What's... regardless of our sins, okay? Yeah. There's never been a nation or a system of a economic system that has propelled more people out of servitude than America. This is the only place that you can come and be an absolute nobody and rise to the tiles and most powerful positions in its military, its government bodies, or it's, you know what I'm saying, or the economy. There's nowhere else. Anywhere else you were locked in by where, what social standing you came from. Right. I mean, there's whole, all of India, if you're part of a, not part of a certain sect, you ain't getting nothing, dude. Same with the Arab world, same with the Eastern, Eastern world. They're still tribal in a lot of the ways they look at a thing. This was the only place where tribes, this is why they put in the Constitution, you know, no man or whichever part of it was, was no man will have a title of nobility. There is no lords and dukes or any of that shit. You don't get to pass it on to your degenerate children that somehow now have fiefdom over me just because they were born into you. That's mm-hmm. not how it worked. That's not what they, that's what the, the brilliance of the founders and the reason why they've all had to be degraded and destroyed as slaveholders and all this other bullshit, judging people centuries ago by how they... I go, can't you ever... Can't you just comprehend that the fact that they knew 
that this was going to cause a civil war then, but still put the idea in that as this country matured and went through, that that battle would have to happen sooner or later for it to be real, and mm -hmm. it did. And here we are. I still listen to people bitch about it. I mean, this is this is how you know that the propaganda machine has been orientated because even in World War II, the Japanese knew that a land war on America was not feasible. There was a faint, like saying, uh, the one general said, there'll be, there'll be a rifle behind every blade of grass. Because he actually had been to America prior to the war and saw the economic engine and the, and, the, and the way the people thought and the rights that they had. He was like, this is, there's no way we could ever take it. So how do you do it? You got to degrade it from within. You have to make them destroy themselves, weaken them, divide them. And you can see it happening. Of course. But then you've seen, like I said, I've, in the last seven years, I think you've seen more people have a come to Jesus moment than ever before. Like I said, I don't see the Democratic Party growing outside of a new graveyard they found. No, to put I out have about, seen you know? a lot of people. Well, a lot of people, they don't necessarily. What I hear more of is I'm no longer on the left. I'm in the middle. That's what I hear now. I don't necessarily hear people say, oh, I'm on the right, because then that requires people to essentially become Christian. When you say you're Republican or you're conservative, it gets associated with, you know, mm -hmm. being religious. Mm -hmm. So instead of people being on the right, I think people are hopping in the middle because they're seeing just how freaking far left the left has gone. We talked about this on the Dave Facone episode. Mm -hmm. The scale has completely shifted. It's become a larger scale in this way far left over here it's such a small percentage of people but it's yanked people this way on the scale because it's so far there's no left. real i mean the democrats of john kennedy would be radical right extremists now i mean the democratic party went from being the workers party anti-conflict anti-intelligence agencies to being their biggest freaking advocate you should how can you not trust the cia how can you not you know what do you mean it's it's wrong to let in millions of people that are going to completely destroy the job market they're for asylees. any of you union people? They're asylees. Because we'll put enough— we'll they have put a enough, right to free health care. Yeah, we'll put enough po bought politicians into your government, and we'll vote away the whole idea of unions to begin with. I had a conversation with someone, and she said, I'm a liberal. And I was like, okay, just— What does that mean? Yeah, so to I was you, like, you I was know? like, do you, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? And I was very careful about it because— these are triggering questions. I was like, do you think a man is a man? And she's like, yes. I was like, okay, do you think a woman can be a man? She's like, of course not. I was like, I don't think you're a liberal. I don't think you're a liberal. I think classical liberalism is, is I mean, even the term liberal is not descriptive for what these people in power are. I mean, they're, they're Marxists. Yeah. I mean, these are cultural Marxists. Everything they're doing to destroy the fabric of the culture says they're following the playbook. All right, exactly how it's done. Um, like I said, you can just look at. Look well, the at, old liberal was like anti-government and like smoke weed. Workers' party, and yeah. Good party, more man. More libertarian. I mean, Leave more kind of. Leave us alone. Yeah, I like I like the idea of libertarian. I'm gonna be completely honest. You know, people ask me, "Are you a Republican?" I go, yeah, "Dude, the Republicans are the fist. Republicans are half the are, to me are even worse than these. These rhinos are even worse than these Democrats because." You're looking at these guys try to pretend like they're these goody two shoes, like a Mitt Romney. This guy tries to act all squeaky clean, and we're on this guy will oh, he'll man, advocate guy. for any conflict that millions of people die in. I mean, these you're gonna try to tell me that guy's a Christian, even he's a Mormon, but Romney least, was before. At least the Democrats are like, we're scum, we're gonna cheat. We don't care. I mean, the the scale of projection from those people is insane. Like. The things they're saying to you, yeah. what they say to you, they are doing 100%. They just they don't have no qualms doing it. These Republicans try to act like they're, you know, morally better. It's like this is why Trump's always like, you guys don't fight. You don't need, you don't do anything. You just mm -hmm. let them walk all over you. And that's the truth. You're seeing how big of wussies these guys are, the rhinos. And then you're finding out when it's come down to the vote, they're going right along with it every time. This uniparty, I think what people have seen is the uniparty really exists. So I don't, I, I don't personally identify as a Republican, I call myself a constitutional conservative. I mean, the people that founded this country, th their wisdom is infinitely larger than anybody today or in the last century, really. 
I mean, that's how good they were. Constitutional how, uh, conservative. Constitutional conservative. So. Oh, I like that. Um, real quick, what do you think of uh, RFK? You know, you can drum up a lot of things. I think I like his idea on, you know, I liked his vaccine policies. I liked how he talked about that. But I am always, he's been a Democrat his whole life. What what is what has he been? You know, what kind of jumps? Because he's running into as an it? independent. Yeah, I mean, because he knew the Democrats would never give him. The time. I mean, they don't even give him security, and he's had a guy try to kill him already. Right. <laughs> I mean, I I don't think he's going to really play a, a big role into anything. I think anybody, but when it comes down to it. I think he's just gonna. They're kinda, gonna go for Trump. People yeah. that would follow RFK. Um, I think. I think he. What he did was maybe turn some people that just had Trump deranged the system to a point where they couldn't listen to anything. But it coming out of his voice, so some of the same things that Trump was saying, they can kind of now. Oh, I can maybe listen to this now. Oh, it's kind of going the same. That's kind of what he said. You know, yeah. like. I do think uh, he helped sort of wake up a little bit more people. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, you can see they want him on, destroyed. Yeah, definitely brought light on. That used to be a too. name that a Democrat would kill to have associated with them. Now it's like he's part of the he's part of the enemies, right? Even though he's probably for a lot of the same crap they want on other aspects, because he's he's for but he that. He doesn't anti- follow. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't follow the playbook. You're really seeing, and that's why you're seeing like the the drop in the intelligence, I think, of these people that are trying to per- perpetrate these crimes against us. I mean, you're, you're getting such... Because they've boxed themselves into this DEI crap and they're hiring people strictly because they check a box and how they look, Which not is because racist. they have any... Comp- we know that. Not because they have any competence in what they're doing. Is you're seeing their messaging is so terrible. They used to be really good at it. Now mm-hmm. their messaging is so bad. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like when, you know, Biden talked about you know, he mentioned that the person was an illegal alien, and then he turns around and says, "I don't want to insult anybody. I'm going to call him." I mean, that <laughs> who uh, well, could have who, who could have said that? But who could have thought about that and said, "People are going to switch that and, and make the correlation that you're defending the murderer and not the victim." Mm-hmm. But that's how they don't care. That's the bubbles they live in now, and they went with it. <laughs> I mean, it's just this is what we're dealing with now. Um, what are we at? Okay, I want to do a quick switch because um, I did want to talk to you about about. Your job, you had mentioned um, you've seen some crazy stuff being a fireman. Mm-hmm. Um, what's like your typical call? Oh, I actually wanted to ask you another question because I asked, I re upped my CPR AED mm-hmm. and I did it at Woodstock. Um, they were they were great, quick and easy, got it, got in and out. And I asked, um, so does anybody have any questions? I was like, yeah, I got a question. Have you noticed any heart problem increases in the past? three or so years he starts cracking up and he's like i don't know if i'm allowed to say anything and i was like you're just sharing your personal anecdotal Mm -hmm. information like i'm not asking for you to represent the firefighter association at all and uh, this actually led to a much longer longer conversation after he and he sighs and he goes i haven't necessarily noticed an increase in heart problems but I've seen a huge shift go from heart problems in the older age to heart problems in the young. So he was like resuscitating Mm -hmm. teenagers, Mm -hmm. 20 year olds, even like a lot of 30 year olds. Mm -hmm. And he's like, the shift went from really old people to now the majority of our heart issues. He's like, I don't know if there was really a spike. I haven't really been like keeping data that analytically, but I had to resuscitate like a teenager like not long ago mm-hmm. have you noticed anything like that you know and i will say this like the military just did uh a study on it and they were real at, they did it was like three thousand percent increase in myocarditis or something don't quote me on that but on the exact percentage but it was astronomically higher than any other year prior to 2020 and they did it with people in the, in the military. military yeah so, which is an, an easier control group because you got, you know, you're not doing the whole country, but you're dealing with, you think the people that you're are dealing with people everywhere. pretty fit and most in a younger generation. I mean, if you go in at 18, you're retiring after 20 at 38. Mm-hmm. Granted that 38's a little bit, got a little bit more mileage on it from your career, but you're still a relatively young man. Okay. Um, and you can just look those up real fast and you'll find those statistics. And it's just like, well, I mean, it's almost kind of, everyone kind of knows it, but doesn't want to say it. You know, and I've been off an ambulance for a few years now. 
I wasn't on it during the pan. Oh, I was on it for the very like for the first couple months of it, and then I got transferred off it. Um, I just think you've just like he was saying, you're seeing younger people now that you never saw before with these ailments. What the numbers are, you can find that out pretty damn easy. Yeah. What What are some of the craziest things that you had to roll up on? <sighs> Man. Uh, you I mean, told I'm, me a couple stories. That's why I wanted to make this part of, part of your uh You know, interview. being in an inner city fire department with, you know, high crime, um, the city I worked in at one point was voted the ninth most city, my ninth most dangerous city in America. It's only with a population of, you know, 150,000. Um, I think it's just the overall, you see how these people live. I mean, you know, and I've always been kind of baffled by like, just because you're quote unquote poor, that you need to be filthy. You know, like I think just you've seen, I what I've got to see is that, a 40 to 50, 60 years of unending propaganda and legislation that has led to the degradation of an entire population of people. Um, it's been, it's extraordinary to actually see how this has happened and, and, and what people, I think what people will just call you for randomly. Like you would never think if your ankle hurt to call an ambulance and go to an ER there are people that will call you three times a day for nothing. I mean, it's like 911? 911? 911. Send me a fire ankle. truck and an ambulance. Maybe the police, depending on what it is. It's great use of tax dollars. You'll have some of these people, we call them frequent flyers. I mean, it's it's a joke, but it's like you can look up the, oh, this guy rode the ambulance 88 times this year. Oh my God. 88. <laughs> like, they actually did it one of the first one of the first years I was on. They actually did a, a the, the news did it, and they actually posted the news. Like the local newspaper did a freaking report on, you know, frequent flyers basically, and they had a list of you know male, female, how many times, and it was like there was like fifteen people that had wrote it over fifty times. Now you got to think, an ER visit is th well, around three grand. For the you know the if you ambulance got ride, yeah, if thousand you, bucks. You know, and it'll say if you don't have insurance, because most of these people ain't gonna have insurance. So the whole take you know seven hundred dollars for an ambulance ride, just basically a cab ride. Yeah, because most likely, if your ankle hurts, what am I gonna do in an ambulance? I'm gonna take your blood pressure, check your pulse, check your lungs. That's it, really. Yeah, you're gonna go to an ER. So you're gonna sit in the ER. You gotta see a reception person. You're gonna see a nurse who's gonna take your vitals. They're gonna give you a spot in the waiting room or wherever. Then you're gonna go see a doctor. I mean. All that has a charge. Bom, 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 bom. So you say $3,000 a pop, 80 times 88. Now, some of these guys live lifestyles where they're not the most healthiest. Maybe they had to do some extra stuff. Maybe they had to put you wow. under, you know, give you some medicine. Maybe they had to give you an x-ray. I mean, they're not paying it. You are. Our insurance rates are so high because this cost is offset on us people that have pay for insurance yeah this is the reason why an aspirin's 80 dollars or something you know which are the insurance i mean this the amount of money that's just being funneled and we saw in covid we were bringing gunshot victims and they were getting put under the covid desk because even though they died from a gunshot they tested positive, tested positive for, COVID. for covid those were being lumped in but you weren't allowed to say that on social media of course not that was one of the things that got flagged for me I had shared someone, I think it was, uh, might have been a police officer or something, said that exact same thing. Like, I watched this guy die from a gunshot or a motorcycle. I saw one, it was a motorcycle accident. Clear, just blown apart, essentially, in a motorcycle mm -hmm. accident. And it got labeled as a COVID death. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. What would I be mean, the point of that? Money. Money. Obviously. I mean, this is the amount of money these go local governments got from the feds. You know, for COVID relief money, that was it. Tens of millions. You yeah. know, each each town, a lot of them got it. You know, and they could spend it on whatever. Well, COVID's over. We got all this money. We're gonna give it back. No, oh, that's not how budgets work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't ever have. You spend every dime you right. get. You know, so um, as far as like with that, how people are living, how that went into that. But then I mean, just going back to like the things you see in the inner, in you know, with crime. 
I mean, I've witnessed, I don't know how many people's last words, you know, you know, the one particular sticks out in my head is like, I went for a, we went for a shoot, a multiple shooting. This is, this is insane. This is shows you kind of like what inner city, what, what we're seeing is what could only be 10 times worse in something like Chicago or now New York or wherever. We pull up on a scene. There's three guys shot. One guy's in the leg. One guy shot in the side. Another guy shot like multiple times, chest, shoulder. He's laying and he's laying on the curb with his head like laying against the curb, Instagramming live himself. I mean, I walked up. I'm like, I thought he's on the phone, but he's he's Instagramming. Check it out, y'all. Check it out. I say, hey man, you want to let me check you out? You got shot in the chest. You may want to put the phone down. No, nah, man, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So I'm like, well, you're breathing. Obviously, I'm going to go check the next guy because you're trying to triage the scene real fast. It's chaos. There's 50 people. It was a house party, you know, big street party. Someone rolled up, just emptied a whole mag into a crowd and hit hit three people. The one kid that's shot in the side, I'm like, well, any one time you're shot in the flank, that's bad. Um, so we're like, oh, this guy's going to be priority. The other guy's walking wounded. He's shot in the leg. Took care of him. You know, I, we load this kid up, and he's going. When he first got there, he's talking normal, everything, and now you're watching him. When you wait, watch someone start to fade, you know, where you actually see the life leaving him. And I remember he looked at me, and he said, look right in my eyes, and he said, I don't want to die. I got a daughter. And I looked at him, but the first thing I thought was, but you're at a house party, street block party, at 3 a.m. on a Wednesday. You know, it's so it's like all the things that actually mattered in his life, which he realized was that daughter, only came to his mind when he was dying. when he was dying. You know, priorities. And we took that kid and we did everything. You know, we got him to the hospital. Doctor slit his side right open. Was literally, and I was standing there, and he said, "Who's got a glove hand? I need help." You know, I'm like, "What do you need? What do you need, Doc?" He goes. Stick your hand in there and hold his lung out of the way. Because I got to start. He started to stick uh, epinephrine right into his heart. I was trying to, like, pump his heart with his hand. I got to hold this guy's lung. As they're, va- as they're bagging him, and his lung is inflating in my hand over and over again. Like, that all happened within the span of, like, 12 minutes. From on scene to transport to, you know. Holding a saying? lung. You know. Wow. Yeah. So, you know. And there... Uh, that's just the one that sticks out. I've seen it. I lost count a long time ago. We had uh, I don't know if you want to keep telling these stories. But these, no, no, they're no, pretty I, gruesome. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that, that's crazy, man. I I know you told me a couple um, when we were training together because I was always curious. But I actually want to come full circle again. I want to talk talk more about uh, one touch. We went on a tangent. Yeah, which is fine. That's what this is for, right? Mm-hmm. We're we're unpolished. I, I wanted to mm-hmm. go freely, but I do want to come back. So if someone wanted to become part of one touch, what would that process look like? Just walk in the front door. You know, a lot of guys are like, I want to get in shape first, and I want to do this, I want to do that. That's great. Make that a part of the training. Don't don't prevent you starting training because you think you're going to get in shape. You know you're an athlete. You know the way that the cardio it takes to do grappling and strike is something you cannot train for. Different. You have to do it. You can have a base yeah. elsewhere. Like you can go on runs and you can lift weights. And right. They will be a tool for you. For sure. But you did, like if you could do a 30 minute AMRAP in CrossFit, it doesn't mean shit. You'll for gas five in 30 rounds seconds. of yeah. two minutes in jujitsu, right. you will die. You'll die. You know, so I always say don't don't prevent starting the martial training because you're trying to get the physical training and do them both at the same time. You're going to end up realizing you don't need to do as much physical training if you're training consistently with that. So, um, you know, I welcome anybody, you know, with or without experience. Some, you know, sometimes if the guy's an athlete and he knows nothing, that's much better for me because I can kind of teach him my way. He doesn't come with any pre pre habits, you know, or pre, you know, pre um, philosophies in his head. I can kind of build them from the ground up because to me, there's certain coaches that can take a guy that's already built and maybe take him to the next level. It's it's more difficult to take a guy strictly from scratch and build him into a, a high level. You know, that's that's kind of why I like with my team. I'm, I'm 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 proud of it and I'm proud of my coaching staff because of what we've produced. 
we've only been actually fighting because the, the gym's only going to be four years old in August. We've only been fighting for about two and a half years actively, comp- you know, active competition. And the team's record right now is 31-3 and three with 24 finishes. To me, that's an, that is a better representation of what you're getting when you have a tired team that are winners and not just a specific guy that can, you know, that's an anomaly that can be awesome when everyone else is a 50-50 fighter. And something. The fact that the entire team wins, you know, and we won – you know, on the amateur side, because we just started turning guys pro, you know, seven titles last year. We had multiple guys in the gym that were the, the number one ranked amateurs in the Midwest. You know, ones that are now fighting in some of the biggest organizations in the world after, you know, roughly four years of training. I mean, that's pretty good. Like, and I like to, I like to think that now that we're moving to a new facility that'll have the recovery and everything else these fighters need, everything in-house, you know, where the coaches here can teach you wrestling, striking, jiu-jitsu. Every coach can do all of it. You don't have these competing philosophies like too many chiefs, not enough Indians kind of thing. Like you don't – our gym, you don't need to have a wrestling coach, a jiu-jitsu coach, a boxing coach, a kickboxing coach. One coach can teach all of it, specifically really geared towards that MMA style. You know, and I think that's what's going to separate us in the long haul because, like I said – Getting that world champion level is something, if you could start it from the very beginning, that philosophy, that's what's going to produce the people that are going to go the farthest and have the longest longevity in this career. So what separates, for one touch, what separates like your team and who are just regular gym members? Because it could be pretty scary I would say to think. Like, I would okay. say nothing. You know, I, I like the idea of regular students training right alongside active fighters. A, it, it, it kind of gives them a tighter brotherhood. There isn't a separation in the gym between fighters and students. Nice. I don't like that because the, the, the student can end up becoming the fighter if he's surrounded by it and can see himself comparing himself constantly to the higher level guys. Granted, there's times we do individual training with just the fighters because they need to be certain levels with certain things. But for the most part, all my fighters are doing the regular classes right alongside regular students and I think it's a great thing for them because they get to see like I said compare themselves but they also get to be a part of it like hey man I was training with him like maybe they get to a certain level that I can help them create that bond help them do some rounds with the guy and they can actually say you know I helped him in his camp and then go you know travel as a team and go see these guys fight and actually compete and watch them on tv and say like that's that's my teammate that's not not a guy that goes to the gym with me well some about having that team behind you too like Say you're one of the top fighters there. Well, I mm-hmm. got my whole team that I've trained for. I don't mm-hmm. want to let my team down. These, my team helped me. Like mm-hmm. that's a that's another driving motivational factor. I would say. I mean, even though the fact that MMA, in essence, when you compete, is a one on one duel, you know, you cannot get there without people around you. There is no guy that says there is no clubber Lang like in Rocky that says I train by myself. I live by myself. You know, it doesn't happen. Cannot. Not in this game. There's too many var- variables. There's too many skills that you have to have people that are better at training with you at all times if you're mm-hmm. going to jump levels. It's cr- if you're the best guy in your gym, that's a problem. You know, you have to you have to have coaches that have no ego that allow cross training, especially in areas where, like I said, if you're not in a high concentration area of gyms, you're going to have to let that guy go places. You have to have that trust, but the, here's where the ego comes. They feel if that guy sees somebody, he's going to want to leave them, you know. And then that that coach can't accept that. Yeah, I can't bring him to that next level. He does need to go there. No, if you leave me, you know that's bullshit and fucking. You know, I've never been like that. If you think the grass is greener, or if you think you found something in your area that can benefit you, you know, then man, brother, go for it, man. This is not. You've got to. Ha- you've got to have that flexibility. You've got to. Build relationships with other gym owners too. You can't. Obviously, it's difficult because at some point you might have to fight guys from those gyms. But you can orientate it enough to where, listen, if our guy's going to fight, it's it better be for something legit. There's plenty of fights in other gyms out there that we can get them, but and establish a relationship so we guy we can send guys to cross train. I don't have the biggest team of guys. It's even like as far as size goes. So I got a kid now that's going to fight at 185. He's like six six. What the hell am I going to do? The closest guy I got is a 170 er who's six foot, and the rest are 45 and below. 
I gotta get back over there and be a body for you. Right. I mean, you yeah, you grappled with him. So like at some point when he's at the point of he needs the live rounds, I'm gonna have to have a relationship with another gym that has guys that can actually train with him and be able to send him up there and know he'll be taken care of. I'd imagine there's a lot of we've talked about it before, there's a lot of egos in the uh MMA world and MMA gym world. I think like from what I've witnessed is like so many of these coaches overestimate their abilities and and I see it just and 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 just overestimate their the abilities like they, as as a coach as a coach and I think um I think like for an example like when we go to Wayans I don't know how many fighters are there by themselves so that meant he cut weight probably by himself I'm there with Every single one of my guys, I am at the Wands. I'm sitting in the sauna with them. I'm driving them to wherever the hell we go so they don't have to drive. We've prepared all their food, all their rehydration. Me and my other coach, we do that. That's not on them. Yeah. You know, you've obviously trying to build them to where they're self sufficient. They know how to do these things. But when a guy's had his brain melted for the last, you know, however, that's a nice thing to know that he doesn't have to do that. And then my coaches are there. I'm going to roll with me. And I've made the point. I said, look at this, dude. Every guy here is by himself. Well, they got their I mean, one of their homies or their girl with them. And I'm watching him eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich right after he weighs in. Like crazy, dude. You know? Not even there. Coach is showing up 20 minutes before the guy fights. Just wa- waltzing in. Is this at the pro level? Absolutely. Wow. 100%. To what you see at the amateur level, you'll see at the pro. I mean, because you got to think. Well, because what I mean, what's the difference between amateur and pro? You just stamp yourself as a pro, and I don't know. Some states might have have like, and I, you know, you have to have a certain amount of amateur fights. I think in Illinois, all you have to have is one, and you can just go pro. You just file for a pro license. And it costs money. Of course. Yeah. Of course. It <laughs> of course. Yeah. But you know, for me, like I'll be at one of the top shows, and I'll be at a Bellator the next weekend. I'll be at one of these local shows. My demeanor, the way I act, does not change at all. The fact that my one fighter was fighting in a pro show to my next fighter's fighting in one of these local amateurs. Good it's, for you, man. That's I'm the awesome. same guy, and I preach and I treat the promoters the same way. This is the only way. I mean, that you, like I said, building the relationships with everybody and the, the logistical connections you have to have to even make this war campaign. That's all. Reality. Life is just networking, of course. It's all networking. And if you're a guy that's trustworthy and is a man of his word in this day and age especially, I mean, dude, you're singled out easily. Easily will be given opportunities that other people won't. So who who are some of the fighters right now, and uh, what do they got coming up? So actually this weekend, or uh, yeah, this this weekend I have got my one amateur, Clay Larson's fighting. He's he's actually uh, my one champion. So like – We'll say with me to go pro under me. There's certain things you have to reach. Obviously, a technical level, but they have to be at least an amateur champion prior to being for me to think they're going to go pro. And obviously, the quality of opponent means something and everything because you can walk into amateur title fights like nothing. But I tend to put my guys when they get to a certain level level in amateurs, they're going to fight the toughest guys. That's what I. That's what you have to have. So the kid we're actually going against has fought. Our previous champ, the 135 champ for this cage aggression organization, he's vacating his belt for his teammate to go for it. And we're actually taking on an opponent that he had fought prior before and beat. So now the kid's actually coming down to his weight class, and it should be actually a really good scrap. Uh, Then the next day I have um, the number six ranked uh, fighter and a 145er from Western Europe. He's coming in to stay with me for a month. His name's Ahmed Vila. He fights for KSW, which is basically like the UFC of Europe. I mean, this promotion, it's a Polish promotion, absolutely freaking incredible, dude. Like, it reminded me of Pride, like the pageantry, the lights, the fire. Like, we talked on the phone. Right, yeah. dude. Like, it was. Because you wanted me to train this guy for a little bit when yeah, he came yeah, in town. Yeah. 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 So he's, uh, he's coming in. He's got a fight May, May 11th in Poland. We have a couple more amateurs that have fights coming up in April. I also have, you know, trying to get Jerry Ariola, my my one pro fighter, my 170. This kid was, you know, we can kind of talk with his situation and why the fight game is so different now. Like, 
he was the number one ranked 170 er undefeated. First pro fight we took on a, a Bellator veteran, smoked him, and basically since then it's it's almost been impossible to find this kid a fight. And you know people are asking me why. I said, well, listen, you're one. And, you know he's asked me why, and other people. I said, listen, you're one and zero. Oh, you are super tough. So a guy that's zero and zero don't want to be zero and one. A guy that's one and zero don't want to be one and one. Okay. They're trying to build themselves. These guys that are 4-0, and 5-0, and 6-0 and are not going to take you on. There is no benefit because they're right at that cusp of a contender series or a smaller re or larger regional promotion, and a loss to you is going to screw you. So the idea that we're, we're going to have to find guys that are basically in the same boat as you, mm -hmm. super tough, they can't find fights locally. But now I've been finding that these guys don't even want to fight. So, like... It used to, because, and I and I say this because everyone's trying to pick their dub. They're trying to pick the. It's w. because the game's changed, and it's not so much where we talked about earlier with the level of athletes come. That's part of it, but it, real in reality, to me, it's the level of knowledge that the fan has now. So before, when I was fighting in the early two thousand, you know, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, people would still boo when it hit the ground. But all they wanted to see was a fucking slugfest because they had no Knockouts. idea of the ground. They did not understand the ground game. And that's why you could still pull a guy out of the crowd. I'll fight him. That motherfucking jujitsu ain't work on me. You know, I won't tap. You know, and they go out there and get their ass kicked for you. Those guys don't exist anymore because now everyone realizes grapple, understands grappling. And you know that because when you watch UFCs now or, and, and when you see an excellent grappling exchange, the crowd cheers. Mm hmm. Crowd cheers now because they understand jujitsu. Well, the amount of growth that the ADCC and grappling in general has had in the everything past in general. Two, Everyone's just years. becoming more knowledgeable. Where, like, when I was at one of the UFCs in Japan, the Japanese crowd were highly knowledgeable on the martial art and every aspect of the martial arts that were being displayed. That's why they were super quiet. Obviously, it's part of the culture, but when they saw a grappling exchange, that crowd went freaking crazy when they witnessed grappling. In America was never happening. You would get booed if it hit the ground. Yeah, they just wanted to see slugfests. That's it. Now people can actually, tr you know, appreciate grappling, and by knowing how powerful grappling is, the loud monsters are saying, mm, "Fuck that!" <laughs> like yeah. I, that guy will twist my neck off. <laughs> you know, he'll t he'll take his arm home with me. They understand that now, so you don't get. It's a smaller group of people now fighting, higher level and smaller, and the way the business is set up is. Those big risks, you know, that they guys just don't want to take them like that. They want to pad their record to about that four to five and zero, oh, and then when it comes to that actual fight that's going to jump them up, that's the one they're putting all their eggs into. But it's like I said, it's a double edged sword because if you've padded your record and now you're going to run into a real guy, he's going to he's going to maul you, you know. So that's kind of some of the problems we've had. Just finding some of my higher level guys fights. My girl, my girl fighter that's in Bellator, Mackenzie Stiller. Uh, she's got to go up two weight classes. She's got to go up one weight class one weight at least class. now. But it was the same for her. She had such a high pedigree of grappling. I mean, she was a Wisconsin State champion wrestler. She's a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. She's a judo black belt and was a competition black belt. So, I mean, she had 200 judo matches. I mean, if she had had... You know, I had a family that could could have afforded more expensive training camps and all this kind of stuff. The way some of these parents dump money, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in their kids' training. I mean, she was probably could have been Olympic level competitor. You know, when you take a girl like that into the women's divisions, which are pretty much two dimensional, they're they're either striker with jujitsu off their back kind of thing. Not many have. Judo, high level judo, and definitely most of them don't have wrestling, offensive wrestling, wrestling capability. Yeah. She by just having those threes with minimal striking, she was able to run through everybody. The fact that she was only four and zero, they were talking they would have to fly people in because no one in the Midwest would fight her. Then we got offered a, a pro debut in Bellator that came out of nowhere. You know, so I tell these guys that are the high level guys that are are hard finding fights you've got to live this lifestyle 24 7 because your opportunity is going to come on a two-week notice right some guy that did a whole camp opponent fell out doesn't want to back out sold a shitload of tickets they need a guy and if you're ready to go those are the fights that instantly flip and change your yeah, whole life you're always ready you don't need to prepare 
hundred percent. And that's how those opportunities, like I said, for the highly skilled guys in the early, that's the only way you're going to jump the line a little bit without it eating up your whole life, trying to find these damn fights. So I always, I always end the show with uh, the question, what piece of advice if you had to give like one solid piece of advice, you're sitting here, you're talking to a, let's say 17, 18 year old kid that wants to be a fighter. What would you tell him? I would tell him, especially in the very beginning, that if you want to be a fighter, you need to have your entire life covered outside of fighting. Your entire monthly nut needs to be covered outside of fighting. At any point where you start to fight for rent, you're going to hate this life. You'll absolutely despise it. And don't want to be one of those guys fighting for rent because you're going to fight when you're not ready, physically or mentally, or both. So I try to encourage these guys to... Continue to try to find a career. If this is what you should, you can do both. If you live the lifestyle, especially in the beginning, you don't need to be training three times a day. As long as you're getting your good cardio and, you're, and you take the time to realize that the first part of my career needs to be nothing but an academy, nothing but going to school, and not thinking about fighting. Develop yourself like that. You'll realize fast enough whether this is going to be cut out for you. You're going to be cut out for this or not. Before, because there's guys that will jump in and just take fights, get their found, you know, their head pounded in. Training under me, I tell them you got at least a minimum, depending on who you are, how, what your background, at least a year before I'm going to give you an amateur fight. Because I'm going to damn well make sure you are ready to defend yourself properly. You can win. Dude, like You can win and get your head fucking pounded in. And if it's a boring fight, I always say there's always a winner in a boring fight. Does anyone give a shit? You need to be able to separate yourself out from the rest of these guys. So if you have that burden of living – on fighting, especially in the beginning. I go, you cannot have not something on the side unless you're making multiple six figures per fight. Right. You're one injury away from being having no income. You're one injury away from being in career over. And if you know, I try to say the best you can hope for, if you do it right, is have enough money to buy a house, pay it off right away, so you have at least some place to live, and enough of a savings to where you can either go start a business or maybe only have to work a little bit to go back to learn a skill to start a career that you can do. I go, that's the majority of the life, the positive life a guy could get out of fighting. It's only less than 1% of the guys that are going to retire on this shit. So if you're smart, this is why I try to talk about it. I say, you should probably go be a mailman. <laughs> you know, like, go be a mailman. Don't be a fighter. Unless you're willing to completely invert your whole life to that 10-year span, 12-year span you have, if you're lucky, that this is 100% where I need to make this whole amount of money to be able to live comfortably afterwards and make actually that damage and trauma I've induced on myself worth it. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, Brett, it's fucking awesome having you on, man. I haven't seen you in a while, too, yeah, so it's man, good it to catch good up. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, good luck to you and the team and everyone, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. I appreciate it.